So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting. It's Tuesday, April 13th, 2021, 6.30 p.m. Um, we're doing this via Zoom. Um, as we have uh, been doing recently, we are reviewing the strategic plan because that guides us in a lot of the work that we do. Um, I won't go into detail, but just naming the highlights of the plan is health and well-being, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facilities, and environmental responsibility. So the roll call, Heather Altenberg here, Kimberly Carr. Here. Phil Saucier. Here. Elizabeth Seifries. Here. Cindy Volts. Here. Jen McVeigh. Here. And Laura Danino. Here. Uh, and our student reps, Joey Lavery. Here. I thought I saw you. Welcome, Joey. Uh, and Ellie Gagne cannot be here tonight. She um, emailed me to tell me so. Uh, if we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll begin by saluting our flag and Jen. Thank you. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that flag. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, may I have a motion for item two? I move we approve the minutes from March 9th, 2021. May I have a second? I I think that was Kimberly. All right. Uh, any discussion or comments? Okay, voting. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion for item three, please? I move we approve the minutes from March 16th, 2021 special business meeting. May I have a second? Second. I second. Thank you, Elizabeth Seifries. Um, Heather Altenberg, or any discussion, excuse me. Okay, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Mm -hmm. Great. So that leads us to item four, which is comments from the public on agenda items. Uh, before we head in that direction, I just had a few things I wanted to say. Um, the board has decided the typical time frame for speaking at regular business meetings um, about agenda items is 20 minutes max. We have already decided to allow for at least for um, an hour time slot. Um, the typical time frame to speak is, um, is uh, three minutes. We're asking in order to allow for maximum uh, people to speak for you to be able to uh, thank you, Jen, uh, for you to be able to um, cut it down to two and a half minutes, please. I will be a timekeeper. Um, and it's really just out of respect. I'm, I'm not going to be angry at anybody or anything, but I am going to chime in at two minutes and give you a warning um, and then try to wrap it up at two and a half minutes. Um, before we head into the public comments, I know this is a big meeting and I just want to say that um, the board has received so many emails um, and they are heartfelt, they are passionate. Um, 
they are mostly, they are all, I should say, about how to finish out this school year. Um, they represent both sides. Uh, I just wanna make it public that um, I ended up responding to people in a cut and paste format. Um, it was to save time on my end um, and honestly some sanity. And um, I want you to know though that I read every email. Uh, and the reason I did it was so that you could get the confirmation that your email was read. Um, I'm sorry that I just didn't have the bandwidth to be able to respond to everyone individually. One of the things that I did realize as I read through all those emails is that there is a little bit of misinformation out in the public. It happens. And so the one thing I wanna say upfront to everybody, and um, please hear this before you make your comments so that you can adjust your comments if they're around this, is that no matter what, however the vote ends up tonight, we are planning on five days a week in-person learning for the next school year starting in September. The board has voted already on a schedule that reflects that. Um, we have a vote today, tonight, later tonight on our budget. Our budget reflects supporting that action of moving forward. However that money needs to be used, whether it's uh, teacher support, whether it's um, portables, whether it's furniture, that would be up to the administration and the principals and the superintendent to figure out. But we are, um, at, we asked those questions and we wanted to make sure that that could happen. So that is not on the table for this evening, regardless of how we answer. Um, I also just wanna clarify the two options that are on the table. One is to continue as it is in the hybrid mode um, as we've been doing for the, for the year. Um, these recommendations are coming from the district planning committee that met several times and came uh, and are presenting these to us. The other option is to return to school four days a week. I want to say up front that the district planning committee as a group, and if you remember and are aware, it consisted of parents and teachers, doctors, staff members, administrators, uh, school board members, and it was a unanimous decision that going back on Wednesdays was not a good idea. So that is off the table. And so it is down to maintaining as we are or going back four days a week. The decision to go back four days a week would entail a two week break after vacation and then a slow roll in period. So Donna, there's been some changes. If I'm inaccurate on this, I've done my research and gone back to emails, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I think I have it right. For Pond Cove in the middle school, it would mean that Monday and Tuesday of May 10th, there's no school teachers are prepping. May 11th or uh, May 12th is a Wednesday. We're keeping the Wednesday uh, the way it's been. And then starting on Thursday, May 13th, Maroon will come into the school. And then starting Friday, May 14th, Gold will come into the school. And then Monday the 17th, all students will be in the school. Now this is with remote students remaining remote, but doing four days a week, Zoom, in-person Zoom and not asynchronous, but meeting with their teachers for those four days. So in a, in a sense, four days a week live with their teachers on Zoom. The high school, the week of May 10th and 17th, Jeff, I hope I have this correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The week of May 10th and the 17th, the seniors are in full-time. Everyone they're, else? Heather, they're starting the sixth. Okay, they're starting the sixth. Right. Would you like to take over then and make no, sure I have it right? No, go ahead. I think everything else should be right. Okay. And everyone else remains in their hybrid or remote, the schedule they've had all year. And then I believe the week of May 24th, when the seniors go into their senior transition project, the seniors end up leaving the school naturally as they do every single year. And that's when nine through 11 hybrid students would come into the school for the four days a week in-person learning. I'm seeing Jeff shake his head, yes. So I'm sorry, I got that one error. Um, 
So that is the slow roll in process for many reasons. One to support the transition. Um, it was successful in September as well. I want everybody to know that especially in K through eight, there's gonna be a big focus on the social and emotional learning for K to eight. And there's the hope to provide outdoor activities um, and when necessary or able to invite remote students in to participate. So there will be a chance for that at times. Um, so that is what I wanna share with people as an upfront and some basic information and knowledge of where we have come to at this point. Um, again, there's two and a half minutes. I want to share as well with the public that we have at this time 31 panelists and 192 attendees in the meeting. I think I am gonna ask Elizabeth to maybe give us a 50 minute warning. Are you able to do that for me? And keep track of the hour piece and I'll yep. keep track of the two and a half minute piece. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Um, so just one second. Okay. Jen is going to be in charge, our amazing Jen Lackery is going to be in charge of calling on members of the public. So you can begin, Jen. Thank you. Please say your name and where you live. Please try to be concise um, and not super repetitive. I know there's going to be similar opinions, but um, try to be concise. Thank you. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, Wynn Phillips is first. Okay, so Wynn, go ahead. Hi, I'm Wynn Phillips, president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. There's been misperception from some of the public about the association and where it stands on reopening. Our position has been the same from the beginning. The health and safety of our students and staff is our number one priority. The association and the board have agreed that the Maine Department of Education safety guidelines regarding the reopening of schools must be followed, and we thank the board for working with the staff to be sure this is the case. Because of this, we have had minimum disruptions to our year. COVID or no COVID, safety and well-being have always been among the primary concerns for schools. Bus drivers make sure kids arrive safely. Administrative assistants monitor absences and notice, notify at home if a kid is missing. Teachers and educational technicians watch over them all day. Nurses take care of illnesses and injuries. Food service employees make sure they are fed. Social workers and guidance counselors help them navigate the difficulties of being a kid. Our custodians and maintenance workers make sure the buildings are clean and in good repair. Safe schools are good schools. We have to be honest, bringing all of our students back into the building will change the safety equation. It doesn't affect teachers and staff in the same way because most of us will be vaccinated but we care about kids. If the board decides tonight to bring students back into the classroom, then teachers and staff will make them feel welcome and do all we can to make sure they're safe. If not, it will not be easy, but education has never been easy. However, everyone has to understand that just as educating kids in our current model has risks, so does bringing students back. We know the risk levels right now. We are managing it. We don't know how these risks will increase with unvaccinated kids, our kindergartners through many of our 10th graders back in the classroom. Nor do we know how students will respond academically and emotionally if we change our current model, things go wrong, and we have to go 100% remote. This is what the board and the community have to carefully consider. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next is David Hughes. I believe Jen will give you the permission to speak. Yeah, he should be able to talk. David, there, are you there? there you are. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I just want to uh, tell you a story. It's a, it's a true story. It's about me. It's about my staff and it really reflects every utility worker out there. Um, as some of you know, I operate the wastewater treatment plant in Scarborough, got a staff of 12. <laughs> During all of this pandemic, we have not had the, um, 
luxury to work remote, um, to treat wastewater on Tuesdays and Thursdays, no different than the water company that has provided you that glass of water sitting next to you right now, or the power company running your computer. Originally, utility workers were going to get be in the second wave of the vaccination. Then the, the state changed to age base, which I thought was very good. And then the clamoring started. Teachers unions, uh, teachers, school boards, Department of Education all stated they wanted to get the teachers vaccinated in order to get the students back into school. Well, we did that. Here And here we still sit. And I sit here and I listen to all the excuses that are being presented now for the reasons why we can't go back to school, even though we did respond and uh, vaccinate the teachers. And I think about my staff that had stepped aside and continued to do their work unvaccinated. I really have a hard time with it. I know it's going to be hard. This has been a hard year for everybody. The fact of the matter is we are green. We meet all the criteria. Frankly, I don't understand why this isn't even a discussion right now. The teachers are vaccinated and it should be an automatic movement to move forward with this. You know, as that's, I said, it's good. that's two minutes. So please finish up. Thank you. Yep. It is going to be hard. And I know there are people that are afraid and it's good. Uh, but the longer we wait, the longer the, that fear and anxiety has to grow. We need to move forward and put those fears to rest and continue with the, the quality education that CAPE is uh, known to do for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Chris Straw. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chris. Great. Uh, so I want to begin by just thanking uh, Kathy Stankard, uh, Noel, and Perry, um, who I know personally uh, from having worked. I see that they're on the resignation list. Uh, I, I loved having you all in the district. So uh, thank you for all your service to the district. And for the retirees, the only one I had direct interaction with was Mrs. Butters, Butterworth at uh, Pond Cove. And my kids were all really sad when, when they heard she was retiring, but we knew, knew it had to happen eventually. So, uh, oh, am I not supposed to? It's on, the, okay, I've never. No, go ahead. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not bringing anything up too early, but uh, we, the kids loved her. She was always a highlight. So thank you to Mrs. Buttersworth. So moving on to the, uh, the COVID stuff that everyone else is caring about. Uh, I'm gonna demonstrate my ability to predict the future and be Mr. Domus. Everyone's gonna, that makes comments tonight. We're all basically gonna say, we want you to do what's in the best interest of the kids. And we're all gonna have our own personal opinions on what that is. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, most of them are just our opinions. And what we're looking for is for you in your wisdom and judgment to uh, make the decision as to what you think is in the best interest of the kids. And I think all of town will accept whatever you come up with, or at least the reasonable people will, so long as you can give us a detailed explanation of why you're proceeding the way you are. And I think uh, it's very admirable that you gave the, uh, the hour or whatever it is tonight for people to make public comments, because it gives everyone an opportunity to feel like they at least have an opportunity to be heard. So uh, kudos to you. I think you did a great job on that. Um, what else did I want to say beyond that? Um, so uh, I think this is all good. You guys are going to make a good decision. I'm happy with whatever you uh, come up with. I think it's a little, a uh, little silly uh, to be reopening. I hear what the last gen uh, gentleman said, um, but the real point is that we don't meet the criteria for reopening, and that's what's really going on here. We all know this. We don't meet the criteria because of our facilities, so we're coming up with a way to meet the criteria by telling all of the remote students they can't come back. You have 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're telling them we can't come back. And that, I mean, if that's the decision we wanna make, so be it. But we are in effect creating a separate but equal education system for a segment of students and saying, even if you want to come back, you can't come back. Yes, it's only for a month, but given how much focus we put on equality and whatnot in this town as of late, how do we feel about making that decision and saying to this group of kids, in order to meet the criteria to allow other students to come in four days a week, we're locking you out of the school system. With that said, thank you all for your time. Whatever you come up with, I'm gonna, personally gonna be fine with it. My kids will survive no matter which way it comes. And again, I'm so glad that I'm not having to make the decision you're making. And thank you, Chris. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Chris. 
Uh, next up is John L. Lewis, John Lewis. Um, you have two minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the board. Thank you to the district uh, planning committee. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge, uh, you know, the effort that's been going into this, I, you know, at the beginning or for, you know, if we look back several months, uh, there has been quite a bit of frustration amongst the community because there was this feeling of not being heard and not being involved. And I just want to point out that the efforts that you've made recently uh, have, have really shown us uh, that you are taking this seriously and that you do want to do and make the right decision uh, for our children. Um, I, I'm in support of going four days uh, a week. I think it is a great opportunity for, uh, for us as a community, as well as the school to take this opportunity and learn from it. As, as you said, the, the plan is to go days a week. And if that's the case and the guidelines or requirements do not change, we can take, we can learn from this uh, by doing so. Um, the other thing that I, I do want to bring up and I wasn't gonna say it, but it had been brought up uh, already from a couple other people um, regarding yellow. So if we, if, if the state decides to designate Cumberland County yellow, it, there isn't a mandate that we must go full remote. It is we can consider going hybrid and we know that schools already around the state in counties that have been yellow have been going full time uh, and haven't really changed anything. Um, so I do also want to point out as well is the remote students. Uh, you know, I, I, we definitely can acknowledge uh, the challenges there are with remote, um, but remote was also an option. It was something that they that was opted into, as and it was uh, known at the beginning that should things change at the uh, within the school system or the schedule changes that they wouldn't be able to to change. So, you know, I again, I you have thirty I, seconds. Thank you, Heather. Um, I, I do like the fact that they'll be getting four days of instruction uh, and added. So it was, again, very well thought out. So again, applaud you and appreciate you for uh, making this effort and uh, looking forward to the vote later tonight. Thank you. Uh, before calling on the next person, I just wanna share that there's 239 people here at this point. Um, that are in uh, attendees and we still, we have um, 31 panelists. So next up is Renee Birch. Hello. Hi. Firstly, a thank you for hearing me tonight. Um, hello, Donna Wolfram and the Cape Elizabeth School Board. My name is Renee Birch. I'm the parent of three students here in Cape um, and I live at 40 Zep Cove Road. I'm a trained speech and language pathologist. I am an expert in childhood communication. When I think about children, how children with additional learning needs are faring in this hybrid model, I despair. When I consider how my own children are learning in the hybrid model, I also despair. The developmentally inappropriate demands being placed on all children at all levels in this model is beyond their abilities. By having three remote days per week, School is asking children to perform tasks that they are developmentally unprepared to do, leading them to being vulnerable to feelings of inadequacy, frustration, and failure. I'll speak to some of the skills I'm professionally equipped to evaluate. The hybrid model places inappropriate and excessive demands on children's communication skills and development, executive functioning, study skills, time management, learning styles, need for collaborative working, social skills, engagement, and development, need for sustained peer relationship development in order to develop social skills. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Hybrid is damaging children by not meeting their needs. These skills are at serious risk of delay given the reduced social and educational interaction for the last 13 months. We wouldn't expect a three month old baby to walk just as we should not expect a first grader or even a sixth grader to work independently alone without assistance to stay on, without live assistance, excuse me, to stay on task and absorb the material. But this is actually what's being asked of CAPE students on remote days, and that's the majority of the week. Children's cognitive and language skills are in no way equipped to meet these demands. 
In-person learning coupled with peer interaction is how children are built to learn. Please allow our children back to in-person school. Please vote yes to four days. Hybrid is really not meeting their needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just canceling the timer. Uh, okay, so next up is Josh D. I believe, I don't know what your last name is. Josh, you're welcome to speak. It looks like, it, there we go. Josh Dennison, Capable as President and Town Employee of the Capable as Public Works. Uh, I spoke before, thank you all for your time tonight. Um, thank you for your hard work in this. Uh, my wife and I are both working citizens of the town. She works in the hospital, uh, running floors and has had no choice to stop from the start of the pandemic. And I work for the Public Works Department uh, to provide services to the town and citizens of Cape Elizabeth as a public servant, which I absolutely love. Uh, I have two kids in the school system. One uh, will be entering kindergarten this year and the other will be in third grade uh, next year, fourth grade, excuse me. And I just wanna do ex extend my support 100% for in-person learning. Um, my children uh, do not do well with remote learning. I can only speak to Bear because he's in the school system. My other is at community services. Um, I think we really need this to go back. I don't know how small communities like the Northern Main region, Caribou, Presque Isle are all back to school um, with far less funds than Cape Elizabeth has and far less technology than Cape Elizabeth has um, in, in some areas. Um, I think we can be creative in doing this and safe in doing this. I feel like there's been a lot of time that's gone by that this could have been um, gone through a little bit faster and, and we could have been doing it already. I know I don't have much time, but I also want to speak to the two weeks after vacation. I don't really know what this is going to achieve. Um, those kids that will be home, uh, quote unquote, during those two weeks will be intermingling with all the children in their neighborhoods, communities, athletics, whatever. And it's shown that community spread is where this uh, takes place um, most recently. And so it would seem to me to be safer to have our children in the schools to reduce the risk of community spread and reduce the risk of closing our schools. You have 30 um, seconds. Okay, Josh, thank you. I don't know why we can't just require a negative COVID test uh, if you travel outside of the state um, to be able to come back to school. Um, I, don't, I don't see that there's any gain. And financially, I don't know how people are going to do that because unless I just stop my job for two weeks, I don't have childcare for those two weeks. So it's very confusing to me what that's going to achieve other than delaying the process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next is Sherry Gustafson. You have um, two and a half minutes. Thank you, Heather. Um, yeah. Yes, so this is Sherry Gustafson. Can you hear me? Sorry, I pronounced your last name wrong. Oh, that's all right. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm at 25 Jewett Road and I um, came here to speak um, to the social and emotional ramifications of the hybrid model uh, for these past 13 months. While many of our students might look fine on the outside um, and their grades might be fine, many of our kids and families are really, really struggling emotionally. Uh, I'm a mom of a middle and a high schooler. And I'm a community member uh, with a lovely circle of mom friends. And I'm also a licensed clinical professional counselor in the community. And I've seen a social emotional toll that the reduced in-school learning is taking on too many of our kids. Um, concerns parents don't wanna come forward and speak on recorded Zoom meetings uh, or write letters to the board or otherwise disclose their child's or family's mental health struggles publicly. And um, Instead, uh, parents and kids are just keeping it to themselves and struggling alone and just kind of <laughs> alluding to it to each other. But you can, you know, they don't want it. They're afraid of being stigmatized. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't like public speaking. <laughs> stigmatized or judged. And um, I think that there's a lot more um, going on than what is um, being understood. So um, being a therapist, I... Um, parents in the community reach out to me pretty regularly asking for help to find mental health professionals for the kids because they haven't been able to find them on their own. When I go to a networking group that I'm in with over 900 counselors and social workers and psychologists in Maine, um, nobody has openings. Um, they're just full and uh, it's, it's really hard right now. 
uh, three years ago, our middle school had a highly visible You Will Be Found mental health awareness campaign, which was wonderful. Um, and our students read books and watched videos and planted yellow tulips. And um, But I'm telling you right now that too many of our kids are not being found. They spend a maximum of 13 hours a week in school, less if they're in high school. And the other three days, they're unsupervised while their parents work or only partially supervised while their parents are working from home. They're skipping missing classes, spending hours and hours on their school issued computers and just kind of slipping back and forth between classes and schoolwork and YouTube and social media. You have 30 seconds, okay, Sherry? Thank you, yes. Um, There's just a lot of anxiety, disconnectedness, low self-esteem, excessive fear, hopelessness, middle school vaping I learned recently, self-harm, substance abuse. Uh, We have a lot of lost kids here. um, And it's important that we pay attention to that. We need to find these kids. Um, especially those who are really struggling. It's really incumbent incumbent upon us to get our kids back to school as soon as possible for as much time as possible. Um, Dr. Shaw has been quite clear in his weekly updates that he's supportive of a full-time school, that the overall transmission rates are actually improved when kids are in school, and that it makes sense to him from a public health perspective. If you Um, could finish up, Sherry, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Stacy. You have two and a half minutes. Are you there? Hey. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Stacy. Uh, hi. Yes, I'm Stacy Hughes. I'm at 8 Hannaford Cove. Um, and I just wanted to, um, you know, speak to all of you tonight. And I truly hope that you have been able to read. I know you've had numerous letters and emails sent to you. Um, but I hope you that, that you read them and um, listened to the planning committee meetings as well. I hope that you all paid special attention to the data presented and the numbers discussed, recognizing such subtleties as that the 20 and 30 year age groups are being categorized as one group. I also hope that you listen to the statements that the waiting, the anticipation, the unknown are so detrimental to people's well being and mental health. If we don't return to school now, we will face this transition back to school in the fall. The fear of the unknown will still be ever present and just brewing over the summer. Yes, some people may may say we are in a routine now, but but the time has come to establish a new routine, a routine that will dispel fears, encourage people and empower them to take control, move forward and ensure that we are truly ready for full five days in the fall. This would be such a positive step for our community as a whole. I hope that you're looking at the data and learning too that there's no difference between the six foot distancing when compared to the three foot distancing. The reason six foot was chosen to begin with early on was because we did not know how the disease was spreading. Well, today, not a year ago, but today we do know otherwise. This hybrid model was meant to be a temporary fix. It certainly did serve its purpose, but again, it was meant to be temporary. The time has come. We as a district are now in the green. Other districts are returning to five days. We have remeasured the classrooms. We know we can distance desks at three feet and return more students to the classrooms. The teachers are now vaccinated. And we know that the spread, if it is occurring, is happening in the community, not in our schools. We have heard- See you at 30 seconds, okay? Thank thank you. We've heard over and over that the safest place for our students is in the schools. Our job of our children is to learn and your job is to to in their best interest, get them back into school as this pandemic truly is winding down. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to all of the information and the research that is out there. I hope that you vote tonight to open the schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kelly, I don't know your last name. You are next, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly McDonald and I'm at Floor Lighthouse Point Road. Um, I get very emotional and I apologize. I want to say up front that I, I just don't want you to perceive that I don't appreciate the endless hours that you all have put into planning for our children's education and well-being. So I, I am sincere in that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't express that I'm disappointed with the two choices being considered. Um, I believe this was rooted in the selection process of the committee. For months, 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 many parents that have been in support of more in-person learning have been asking for a dialogue, not just public comments. We do appreciate this opportunity of public comments, but we've been so desirous of a dialogue to be heard. 
Um, this comes along, it, 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 it falls terribly short of a two-way conversation and problem solving. Um, we, you are considering enormous issues that have enormous impacts on the social, emotional, and academic well-being of our children. Without dialogue, you can expect division in our community, which is what you're seeing. When in fact, we do all know that we all want what's best for our children. We just have different thoughts and perspectives about how to make that happen. So I do agree. I know we all want what's best for our kids. Um, while we appreciate that the creation of a committee of 29 people happened, we were very disappointed, this group that I am a part of, we're disappointed that 27 of the 29 were employees or associated with the school and school board. This isn't representative of all the interested parties. The value in problem solving and brainstorming comes in gathering varied perspectives and backgrounds. This rich is, is what leads to creative problem solving. Um, again, I'm, I'm very appreciative. I wish it were five days. I beg you if you're talking about the four day model, which I guess I would have to vote in favor of since that's the best of the two. You have 30 that, seconds. That these be full days because these shortened mini days um, represent an hour of lost education. So four, four days of education at the longer regular school day would be worth like another half day of schooling. So please consider longer school days please, please consider in joining up with other community members in a dialogue as we move forward. I thank you for your time and effort. I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, Amanda Marston, you are. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Marsden. I'm a Pond Cove kindergarten teacher, and I'm going to spend my two and a half minutes saying all the things I'm thinking, which my principal's probably rolling his eyes right now. I can't see him, but um, <laughs> my first thought is I would really like us, this is the only thing I'm going to say about um, this in-person versus hybrid. I would really like us to stop saying the word reopening when we have very much been open and working tirelessly, we are very much open. Secondly, I would like to say thank you. First, thank you to the maintenance workers for cleaning our buildings, our door handles, our floors, our bathrooms. And this is especially to Rick Witten, who I have the most contact with. He's in the kindergarten wing each and every day. To our nurses, obviously, um, especially Erin Taylor, where I could just cry and just want to hug her all the time. Um, she has done nothing but be incredible. My family had COVID and she walked us through every step of the way. I never felt alone. So Aaron, you were an amazing human. Uh, social workers and school counselors, how do we even begin to thank you for the tireless amount of hours and minutes and seconds spent away from your own families to tend to the needs of all students, both remote and in person. That's Bree, that's Megan, that's Chip, that's Deb. We are just eternally grateful. Every single ed tech at Pond Cove for bending over backwards, changing duties, moving schedules, working in and out of classrooms without being vaccinated, mind you, before we were vaccinated, consistently moving around. Um, and of course, my colleagues, my coworkers, my friends, um, for always arranging, rearranging, planning, replanning, changing the scene, changing on a dime, prioritizing our students' needs consistently over our own. And finally, I would like to thank our students. You have 30 seconds. Okay, Amanda, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Because at the end of the day, our students are the ones that are listening. Our students, our children are the ones that are hearing this discourse and this dialogue. And we are the adults that need to do better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jess Davis Knowlton. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jess Davis Knowlton. I'm a PhD in molecular biology, and I have a student who is a rising kindergartner who will be joining Pond Cove next year. Uh, I wanted to take a moment um, to say that we've seen a great deal of evidence that there is no community spread within our school systems throughout this pandemic. And that has been extraordinary and great accomplishment. 
However, we're also seeing that the age of patients is, going, is becoming lower and lower as more and more of our elderly population becomes vaccinated. So the likelihood of these students cropping up in the schools and potentially transmitting in the schools is unfortunately going to go up as well. So although we've had no community spread within the schools so far, it's much more likely now than it ever has been within the pandemic. Um, I'd, also, I'd also like to point out that the, the variants that are present within the population are a more contagious version than has previously been our working understanding. So many of the rules that we have come to understand about COVID-19 and about SARS might not be as accurate as they once were. I'm very excited that uh, we have this conversation and that we have the ability to, to give our, our thoughts on all of these different matters. So thank you very much for your time. And my last comment is that although we know that our children are at very low risk for the most serious complications of COVID, the fatalities, there is still mounting evidence that there are long-term effects. And for long-term effects for a five-year-old, that's a lifetime of long-term effects. So thank you all again for all of your work. And I look forward to hearing what the decision is tonight. Good night. Thank you. Uh, next is Elliot Hughes. You should be able to speak. Um, can you hear me? I can, thank you. All right, um, my name is Elliot Hughes. Our school is in the green zone. This means that we should be in school five days a week. Other school districts are doing it, so why aren't we? Everyone's education is being crushed. We are only learning about half of what we should learn this year. Being remote three days a week is not good for anyone's eyes. Fourth graders are on a screen three hours a day and three days a week. We have been doing so for the whole school year. Now the school year is almost over. Imagine being on a screen that long. It would hurt your eyes so much afterwards. My brother is in eighth grade. He is on a screen doing schoolwork three times as much as me. Students are already on a screen a lot. To prevent this from causing more damage to kids' eyes, we need to go back to school now. You, may, you might be thinking that students will get COVID-19 from going back to school. This is not true. COVID-19 is not lurking around our school. It will be, it is being brought in by students and staff that travel. I say that if students or staff travel, they must quarantine or be tested before returning to school. This allows students to return to school four times safely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, next is Timothy Reiniger. Did I say that correctly? Sorry, Timothy, if I destroyed it. Timothy, you can unmute yourself. Hi, it's okay. Alice, not Tim. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you. Um, uh, someone earlier said tonight at this point, no, why would we bother with this? And that, that actually got me thinking and, and um, made me change what I was gonna say. Um, I definitely want to bother and get our kids back to school as much as is possible. I thank you all for the hard work. And I, I can hear that it gets interpreted that getting the kids back to school somehow um, doesn't pay respect and uh, acknowledgement to how hard everyone's working. And that's not the case at all. Uh, we're very grateful. Um, I think where I get passionate and even frustrated, I'll say that, is a town that I grew up in, in New England town, double the size of our town, similar resources, way more COVID cases. They were hybrid through mid-October and then went back full-time in elementary and middle school and high school and back full-time in, in February. I know it's a different school. I know they have different rules, but COVID doesn't act differently. CAVE is one of the best schools in Maine. And I'm hoping that we would be the leader in opening within guidelines to keep everyone safe and get our kids back in school. It's not an opinion that the virus spreads in the community, not in the schools. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to speculate that it's going to get worse. We don't know that. We don't know anything about the variants yet. 
Um, it's, we don't know, there's nothing been proven yet. Um, the kids still do not spread. That's what Dr. Shaw says. And if teachers are vaccinated, the ones who might be at risk by just simply being the adults, they're vaccinated. And Dr. Shaw's comment, quote, vaccines are exquisite in preventing hospitalizations and death. Yeah. That's an odd word, exquisite, but that was his words. Um, I'm, I hope we can go back as much as possible. Um, I'm listening to teachers and staff comment on our kids' mental health. And sadly, it occurs to me that the teachers and staff don't know my children this year as they would in other years. You have 30 seconds. Thank you, Heather. They've seen them twice a day, half their face. We see the whole person the rest of the week. And I can tell you that it's, it's worse than it is and they really need to be back in school. We're grateful for your time, your effort. And I just support that we go back as much as we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Amy. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. No, I still money. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you to the school board and, and thank you to Superintendent Wolfram. My name is Amy Parsons. I live at 43 Stony Brook. I have three children in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I wanna thank you all for your service tonight and, and let you know that I understand um, what's obviously gone into the last couple of months of planning and decision-making. As school board members, you have been entrusted with the responsibility for evaluating our school's educational programs to determine the effectiveness with which schools are achieving the educational purpose of the school system. According to your code of ethics, among many other ethical obligations, you agreed to work to provide high quality public education for the children of Cape Elizabeth, to consider the educational needs of our children and how they will be affected by your decisions and deliberations, and to encourage input from citizens on educational issues and to consider such input in your deliberations. In light of the fact that Cape schools can return to five days of in-person learning under the current distancing guidelines, I don't see how you have the authority to vote against doing so. There is a reason why governors across the country, including several in New England, uh, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, just to name a few, have mandated schools to resume five days of in-person learning immediately. There is a reason why President Biden has advised that schools must resume five days of in-person learning as quickly as possible. The reason is because they are following the science and a clear recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and quite a long and varied list of qualified physicians and scientists. The mental health pandemic is real and it is now. And for a town that claims to prioritize children and- You have 30 seconds, Amy, okay? I don't see how you can do anything other than return our children to school. It has been eye-opening to participate in this process from a parent's perspective and to see other demands and rhetoric elevated above the educational, physical, and emotional needs of the very, very overwhelming majority of Cape children. To me, any vote other than a vote to return our children to school full-time does not honor your ethical obligations as board members. Thank you for your time. Uh, Valerie Levanos. Levanos, that's fine. Levanos. My name uh, is Valerie Levanos. I live Levanos. at 15 Stonegate Road, and I have a sophomore and an eighth grader. And I appreciate everything the board has done. I know most of you are parents also. And of course, nobody wants to see, um, you know, the kids learning remotely or sitting at home more than necessary learning via computer. But um, I also have colleagues, the company I work for is located on the North Shore of Massachusetts. And I've seen colleagues um, have their children return to school five days a week. And what concerns me is they're saying that now their kids are actually out of school more than they're in school because they've had to repeatedly shut down because of high cases in those schools. So as much as of course, I'd love to see my kids return five days a week or four days a week um, you know, in person, I also really fear that we're gonna have shutdown after shutdown after shutdown, it's gonna be highly disruptive. So I just hope that that's taken in, into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Christine, you are next. Christine, I think you need to unmute yourself first. There we go. Hi. Hi. Hi sorry. That's Hi. Okay. Um, so I speak to you um, in favor of voting for the four day in person school plan put forth by the advisory committee. Um, I um, have two children at Pond Cove. And I am also a family medicine physician. I currently work as a hospitalist at Maine Medical Center. I have privileges both in pediatrics and adult medicine. Um, I'm also one of the 50 plus physicians that wrote to you in support of opening the schools for four days a week. Um, our group has cared for the majority of hospitalized COVID patients in the entire state, and we meet regularly to review the data. We are currently cautiously optimistic about the current circumstances due to the vaccine. Last March, schools were closed because so much was unknown about COVID and transmission and the potential impact upon children. Since then, we have learned that our safety measures are highly effective and school transmission is far lower than the community. I quote Dr. Shaw, vaccines are highly effective against this new strain. The new strain spreads the same way, but it is better at spreading. The tools we have used thus far, face masks, and distancing are just as effective at preventing this new strain. Dr. Shaw also endorsed a return to full-time in-person education under the CDC guidelines of three feet spacing. I wanna stress the importance of referring to the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, who have both advised a return to full in-person education. The pace of the vaccine rollout has continued to accelerate in Maine. There has been a slight uptick in the young adult uh, population, but despite this, COVID hospitalization rates and mortality continue to decrease. At Maine Medical Center, we are closing many of our COVID wards. The vaccines available are shown to be highly effective against this variant. 80% of adults over age 65 have been vaccinated. And as of this past Friday, 43% of Maine residents have had at least one dose of this vaccine. I am hopeful that by May, when you are considering bringing the children back, we will be in even a better place. The risk of contracting COVID in schools remains low. However, the biggest- You have 30 risk seconds. Staff, okay, I will skip ahead. <laughs> we know that within main DOE requirements, CAVE schools can physically and safely return to hybrid students and full-time instructions. Four days per week um, is a significant increase to students in person while allowing Wednesdays to be available for teachers, well-being during this stressful year for meetings, preparation, and time to increase opportunities for remote students. The majority of the medical community, including the CD, supports this decision. Members of the board stated last August when we were deciding to return to any in-person education, if we can't do it in Maine, where else should it be? We have consistently led the nation COVID response and vaccine rollout. I ask you this question now. Please vote in favor of the four-day uh, week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, next is Susanna mazel hubs Hi, thank you, Heather and everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, I wanted to say that my opinion on all this is, is relatively neutral. Um, given the amount of time left once kids get back into the school, uh, it seems like a lot of work for basically three weeks. Um, I'm not sure how that's gonna play out for every single child who goes back to school, uh, especially those who are, have difficult uh, time with transitions. So I'm, I'm ambivalent, I'm on the fence. W what I wanted to say was, um, while I understand that the emotions uh, this past year are super high, uh, the more time that passes and the more uncertainty that passes that it becomes only more so, more true. Um, I know people, parents, everyone is stressed out um, and that this is all new. We've never been here before. I still can't help but feel disappointed by the um, highly critical uh, nature that has, has come about um, in the past couple of months between what it feels like to me, what it looks like parents versus teachers. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, that bums me out because I, I think that it's too easy to to get on the bandwagon of, of saying our teachers need to do this, need to do that, instead of pausing, taking a step back and, and trying to see it from their viewpoint. 
Um, I, I realize that the, you know, the stats and the data are how they are, but it, you know, life is mostly in the gray. And I think we are still largely in the gray with uh, reference to COVID. So mostly what I wanna say is good job school board, good job teachers, administrators. Um, thank you all so much for hanging in there. And um, I hope that if we ever are in this, these uh, uh, shoes again, that maybe hopefully we'll learn something about etiquette in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Zakia Nelson. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make um, brief comments uh, to clarify a few points um, that um, first the cases in the community, the new cases in the community are in fact increasing. Um, and that is consistent with regional trends. Sorry, <laughs> there's some great background music, I apologize. Um, that is in fact consistent with regional trends and what we're seeing nationally. Uh, the proportion of those confirm those newly confirmed cases are um, uh, are um, from uh, new variants, and in fact, we do know that those are much more transmissible than the wild type virus, and that um, they may, in fact, be um, more uh, you know a more um, serious with regards to risk of. Um, advanced disease or death. So um, I just need, uh, I would like to make the point that in fact, cases are increasing in the community. And that if we were in fact to follow the CD, the US CDC guidelines, um, uh, the recommendation um, for the middle school and the high school would be to stay in uh, the hybrid format for um, learning right now. Um, secondly, uh, I um, wanted to point out that the data that we have um, that shows that um, we can, uh, that transmission within schools can be limited um, by mitigation me measures, meaning masking, distancing, et cetera, is based on studies in which um, a stu uh, schools, uh, the students wore masks, um, uh, maintained distancing of at least three feet, mo uh, most often six feet. Um, there was limited class sizes and things like that. So- you have 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think many people, I think I, as, a, um, uh, as an epidemiologist, I work for the US CDC. Um, I would not have concerns about the students returning for uh, full in-class instruction if it weren't for the fact that when they return, when all the students return, we will be reducing many of the um, safety measures that we have put in place. And what it, that is, um, there will be reduced cohorting, there will be more students, uh, greater classes and reduced physical distancing. Zakia, and that's, yeah, that's it. Thank if you, you could so, just finish up, thank you. No, that's fine. I don't wanna go over <laughs> your time. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, next is McCormick family. You have uh, the ability to speak, but you need to unmute if you'd like to speak. Oh, hi. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you to all the teachers and everyone here tonight. Um, shout out to Aaron Taylor. You're the best. Um, I am just curious. I have a question. My children have been fully remote since the beginning of the year. Jack and Tiger. One is in, um, Cape Middle School and one is freshman in high school. And when we decided to have them go fully remote, um, it was, you know, for a lot of different reasons, but one of them was because we were really worried about the teachers. I think I spoke in one of the meetings before and I said, you know, the teachers of our school didn't sign up for this to go to school and um, put themselves in so much uh, danger now that they've all been vaccinated or most of them have been vaccinated. I can't believe how exciting this is. Um, and I got my second vaccine today. My husband gets his second vaccine. You know, things are really looking up guys. Um, so I'm just curious, does this plan um, to reopen at four days a week, does it mean that my children will not be able to come back to school? Are they going to be prohibited or banned from attending the public school um, in order to go forward with this plan? And 
does anybody else have a problem with that? It seems to me it's kind of separate, but, um, you know, separate, but equal. And, you know, I think that if you opted for a hybrid as we did and went remote throughout the year, um, you know, we did it to, to protect our teachers, to protect, um, you know, for some reasons, but there's a lot of families I think who went skiing in Aspen or they went, you know, to have a vacation in Hawaii um, or if they didn't feel like going to school, you know, they just zoom in. And, and so I just, I think that if you're gonna go back to school that you should invite all the students back, not just some of them because the times have changed. And so I would hope- 30 that seconds. That into consideration and thank you for this amazing community that we live in and we're gonna make it through this. That's, I promise you, um, it's gonna be so great when the, all these kids are gonna be back in school with their wonderful teachers in this wonderful community. And it's just, it's just, it's very soon. It's coming guys, it's coming. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. And um, this is not a question and answer, but I think that answer will be, um, that question will be answered in some of the reports and explanations. So we're not gonna tackle that at this moment. Um, we have Nicole is up Heather, next. I just wanna jump in and say we've reached about 50 minutes. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Boucher, 14 Grover Road, parent to a remote Pond Cover. And first of all, I wanna thank everyone for their hard work on all of this. Obviously this year has been nothing any of us have expected, parents, teachers, students, um, facilities, administration, it's been a year. I think we're all growing tired of it. And I think one of the things that's so great about Cape Elizabeth is that we can have a discourse about things like this and hopefully keep it respectful and appreciative of ever, everyone and all the work they're doing. So with that said, I feel like this is a lot of transition for a couple of weeks at a time when it's very clear that there are variants running around um, that are going towards kids more than adults. The adults are getting vaccinated, the kids are not. I shudder to think of what another transition for my kid would be only to come back because we have to close down to, you know, a, um, an outbreak in the schools, which we're going through right now. And I don't want to hear that my neighbor's family has COVID and they're dealing with that. And um, I just, we're, we're all making it through this year. I would love to see all of this time spent on getting them in school five days a week in September. And as a remote parent, I'm also very concerned that, you know, hybrid isn't working for students, but remote isn't working either. And it, I know that remote parents did sign up for the entire semester, but it feels like if you're changing the entire scope of choices available to us, many of us may have chosen four days a week. Personally speaking, our reasons were involved high-risk parents who are now vaccinated and that our child doesn't do very well with transitions. And so we felt that four stable days of remote education was probably better than switching back and forth in hybrid, but that would be different 30 seconds. because we'd have four stable days in school, which would obviously be better for his mental health. Um, but again, I will, I'm, I'm neutral on this decision, whatever you decide. I know that you have all the expert information and have the best interests at heart of everyone, including the students, and we'll make it to September. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And Tara Bucci, you have two minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, one of the biggest things I do with my family is I talk about risk and reward. What is the risk and what is the reward? In these moments right now with our classrooms, there's a big risk and there's not much of a reward. I have two totally different classroom environments from my gold and my maroon. My gold is very quiet, academic, focused. I can get through many different lessons in a day. My maroon is active, happy, personable, movement-based. I can get through lots of lessons, but not quite as much as gold. So now I'm gonna bring the two together and I'm gonna to ask to be in charge to make these two classrooms work together for what? Eight 
days or two months or whatever it is, the choice you have to make is this. What is the risk and what is the reward? Your risk is people getting sick and kids not getting along and having behaviors and teachers being unhappy. Your reward is what? That's the last thing I'm gonna say. Thank you, Tara. I don't see any more hands. So thank you to all who spoke. Um, we're gonna move on with the agenda. Joey, thanks for being here, for being patient. And go ahead with your update, please. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> so going into the student uh, high school report, so looking at clubs and organizations at the high school, the junior student council is looking to doing a uh, public virtual bingo night, which will hopefully be a fun uh, activity for the community to bond around. And we certainly await for uh, approval on that activity. The senior student council is also working on their final fundraiser. And hopefully that is uh, productive as all other ones have been. Moving on to achievements to be noted. I saw this on the website and I think we need to put a special shout out, especially to our music program, who we've been awarded uh, for the sixth year in a row, a special accommodation, showing that we have a quality music program at Cape Elizabeth, excuse me, at Cape Elizabeth. And also that the music department won the 2021 MMEA District One Solo Festival which is, I'm told, a very big accomplishment. So congrats to the music department on both those fronts. Looking at academic topics, juniors took SATs today. So we obviously wish them the best of luck in that standardized test and hopefully they get the score that they were looking for. Looking at student life, we have just come into the conclusion of Spirit Week. It was a great uh, set of activities to just bond around and try and return, return that sense of normalcy uh, to our students. So we had such activities such as uh, staff trivia, guess the uh, staff baby photo, and we even had a scavenger hunt, which were all, which were all fun activities. I'm uh, mad props to the sophomore student council for putting that together. I'm also pleased to uh, inform the board that we will be having graduation at Fort Williams this year, which is uh, relieving to many seniors that we'll be able to continue on this trip, continue on this tradition and have graduation at the fort. I also want to make a special note of several Cape students who performed very well at uh, the main state uh, science festival and really did Cape Elizabeth proud and I I think it shows just the quality of education that we are receiving here. Oh, I have no concerns from, for the board, from the student body. And at this time, as we are moving to the, at the beginning of May term 1D, I'd also like to offer my gratitude to the board administrators and faculty for all the hard work they've done over the past year and continuing this uh, great education that we receive at Cape Elizabeth. Is there any questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. We now have a presentation from social workers. I see some of you here. I'm gonna just pass it on over. Thank you, Heather. I'm going to share my screen. All right, you can give me feedback. Is my presentation up and only my presentation? <laughs> okay. Um, so good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Hansen. I am a social worker at the middle school. Thank you to the school board for inviting us to present tonight on how we as a district and each school have addressed the social and emotional needs of 
our community during this very unique year. We had representatives from each school's counseling department who um, will share out who we all are and what we have been doing. From a district-wide standpoint, I'm really proud to highlight that um, we have a lot of accomplishments that have happened across all three schools. Student-based Kindness Week, that was a student-led initiative. Yellow Tulip Project, national um, project that helps to smash the stigma of mental health. If you haven't checked out our garden at this point, the tulips are ready to burst and that will be beautiful. Um, we've had a lot of staff training this year related to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, with a pandemic focus on systemic racism. All staff across the district um, received trauma-informed training and a number of folks went on to um, do a sub, a sub master's level course, which was phenomenal that they took the time to do that. All new staff each year get suicide prevention training we have a wonderful mindfulness director who has um, reached out to staff, students, and the community, which we'll touch upon. Um, and just to highlight also the technology education staff have received to relieve their own stress to be able to support students um, and pivot with this sort of new way of teaching. At the beginning of the year, each counseling department reached out to um, parents to offer any support and essentially a needs assessment, knowing that it was going to be a, a potential stressful year and start to the year. We've had ongoing collaboration and communication with teachers in the building um, and parents have also been offered some mindfulness series. We um, want to highlight that this year, especially Counseling departments have been focused on basic needs for certain families in the community and connecting them with resources. Thanks, Sarah. I will um, talk about Pond Cove. At Pond Cove, we have two full-time school counselors, Megan and Bray, and a full-time social worker, Chip, and myself, who has a half-time position as a social worker. And we all um, share duties. Chip and I will work with students who have IEPs and have social work um, services on their IEPs, as well as working with the general ed population. And Megan and Bree are um, available to all the kids in the school. Okay. So some um, social emotional trends that we've seen this year, and we wrote this from the Pond Cove perspective, but as it turns out, it's pretty consistent um, across the three schools. So I'm really talking about this as a district. Um, hybrid students are reporting in-person days are going well. Remote days are more difficult as a lot of people have spoken to. Um, overall, we're seeing fewer in-school disruptive behaviors and social struggles. Social um, stress and anxiety have increased both in students and families and our contact with families, we're noticing that as well. We've increased our parent communication and support to families. The, some of the students we've noticed uh, trend to have lower frustration tolerance and a more fixed mindset way of thinking, um, giving up easier, um, you know, not sticking with something when it's harder. And we can all think of many possible reasons for that. Um, we have seen the trend of staff, all staff being more flexible and creative in order to meet student needs. We put individual increased attention on individual students and families trying to meet each um, person's unique needs. We've also seen lots of resiliency and flexibility in student, staff, and families throughout this um, surviving a pandemic time. School-wide supports in Pond Cove. We have um, a responsive classroom school. Um, teachers have been trained in that, and that has provided a lot of social emotional support to each cohort. Um, Peaceful Pond Cove is a school-wide initiative that um, encourages positive behaviors and supports that. 
We have um, with Bree Gallagher, Wednesday opportunities for Zoom morning meetings and support. Well, I guess that's um, teachers do that as well. But Bree has also offered um, open Zoom meetings. And the staff is also engaged in social emotional learning for adults and why that is important. Some student groups um, are the civil rights team and the E team. We, um, as a counseling social work department, have provided um, parents the opportunity to respond to a survey in the fall. And we followed up with um, contact and services for the students that were identified as needing more support. We're seeing students regularly, um, both hybrid and remote students. And we um, estimate that about 20% of the students in Pond Cove are receiving regular support from one of us. Um, guidance lessons are happening both in person on Zoom and on the school counselor's blog. Recess and in-classroom support is provided using, and as I mentioned, using Wednesday time to add extra support for students. Open Zooms for any student who is working remotely in grades two through four. Additional academic and social emotional support has been provided for special education students as well. For parents, there's a wellness website from um, the school counselors with some parent resources. Educational sessions um, on Zoom were conducted with help from the PCPA. And um, we all work with parents and families as much as we can to help them um, to support them in remote learning. And that includes with um, our technology. Um, we don't provide technology help, but that is available in the school. And then for staff, there's um, a wellness website with staff resources and there's social emotional learning optional staff meetings. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. So at the middle school, we have a, an extensive and experienced team. Stephanie and Kim are our school counselors. They are the point people for those particular grades related to social, emotional, and academic concerns from students, parents, and teachers. Um, I'm a social worker across all grades. I also manage 504 plans and have a focus on building executive functioning skills. Louise Lynch works with our special education population who have social work goals in their IEPs. And we're also fortunate to have Erica Marcus in her um, second year as mindfulness director implementing programming in the classrooms around mindfulness as well as um, building capacity within our staff and parents. Um, it's really important to highlight that it's been a school-wide effort with the theme of building connection during this unique year as in as in as much creative ways as possible. So teachers have gone and staff have gone above and beyond trying to figure out how to create connection amongst their students. And here are just some of those examples. We also have some wonderful kids who are involved and regardless of if it's Zoom or in person with our civil rights team and our student council. The counseling department specifically, our goal this year was to um, be available, be known, provide resources and also support that connection within our community. Um, some highlights is we have been sending out a weekly newsletter since April of last year, there's an opportunity for students to fill out a Google form as a check-in if they would like um, a, a social worker or a counselor to check in with them or just to let us know how they're doing. It also provides resources. Um, we offer social emotional learning. We pivoted halfway through the year noticing that really kids just needed to connect with each other and offered social Zooms just playing games or talking, whatever it might be to have that opportunity. This year, especially, there's been a focus on executive functioning skill building um, with the thought that lots of kids were doing way more independent work and needed to um, be supported in those types of skills to be successful. As always, we're doing ongoing individual and group counseling. We have mindfulness um, series going on in the classroom. We are crisis responders. And um, you can read in terms of what we'd, we have offered parents um, and for staff, 
mindfulness and also a, a training recently, sort of a suicide prevention booster training, which went over very well and was um, very pertinent in regards to the times that we are all functioning within. Um, as a that is an end to Cape Elizabeth Middle School's portion. Um, we asked, or a, a language arts teacher came up with an assignment asking students basically to identify a silver lining out of this pandemic or what they have learned. Um, it's up in our main hallway. Here's some samples. I, if you're in the school, I urge you to take a look. I'm, it will give you a smile and a chuckle. We are so proud of our students and how resilient um, and adaptable and flexible um, they have been this year. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about some of the um, important social emotional supports available at the high school. Um, my name is Danielle Grimes and I am one of the social workers at the high school um, as well as a parent of a student at Pond Cove. Um, our counseling team is made up of three counselors, Brandy LaPointe, Eamon Keenan, Elizabeth Thomas, um, as well as myself and Joyce Netto, um, who are the two social workers. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I broke down um, the supports at the high school into four um, different sections. Um, systems and curriculum based supports, peer based supports, um, the supports that are being offered to staff, as well as trainings that the staff has um, participated in, in order to better support um, students and families. So for the system and curriculum based supports, um, as the other schools um, kind of organized and completed a needs assessment at the beginning of the year, the high school did that as well. Um, that was emailed out to all um, parents of students within, the, within and outside of the building. Um, and then the counseling team reached out to parents um, in any areas that were flagged for concern um, so that we could talk about next steps. Um, the uh, student support team SST meets weekly to um, discuss any um, students who might be meeting any of the metrics used to determine if a, st a student is struggling. So that would be grades, attendance, change in behavior. Um, and this SST process generates a lot of um, school-based plans, individual meetings and follow-ups with students or families and possible referrals to either outside providers or in-house supports like social work or um, the guidance department. Um, we also completed bi-weekly meetings with the counseling and administration teams to talk about anticipated social emotional needs of students and staff, um, immediate needs as well as future needs. Um, the option has been available to high school students to attend four days a week. Um, for various reasons, if they feel like they're struggling or social isolation. Um, continued individual counseling and social work appointments um, have been ongoing with students um, and parents as needed in person and in remote. Uh, synchronous classroom instruction. Uh, this has been particularly beneficial because um, it works to address the social isolation and predictable routine for our students. Um, students who chose to come in four days a week um, were not repeating any lesson um, because every lesson was new and moving forward. And so um, that has been something that students have appreciated and have mentioned as working well for them. Um, increased referrals for more formal, formal services, um, school plans, 504s, and we um, have been doing a lot of executive functioning and additional tutorial support with academic skills, freshman health class, and freshman academy. And those are more of our curriculum-based supports that work with the social emotional needs. Um, for peer-based supports, a lot have been mentioned already um, as district-wide initiatives, um, but some specific to the high school are advisory on Wednesdays. This is the same cohort of students and advisor within a student's high school career. We have the Upper Links program, Natural Helpers, Best Buddies. Um, as the student representative mentioned earlier, we just completed our Spirit Week. 
um, ongoing school activities, clubs and sports with um, minimal disruption to those overall. Um, weekly meetings have occurred between um, senior students and administration in order to get their voice about graduation and um, their preferences for end of year events. Next slide, please. Um, for staff support, we have been participating in virtual yoga, staff meditation, book club, music recommendations, open forum during faculty meetings um, to support connection, which um, I believe the majority of the high school staff have really appreciated um, from our administration. Uh, Bi-weekly meetings and ad, um, administration's check-in time for remote teachers. Uh, teacher prep time and workload were considered in developing the schedule and opportunities to have um, question answers with experts. Um, Dr. Blazell was in last week. Um, trainings and staff, uh, trainings to support students and families. So as was mentioned earlier, the trauma informed school training that the entire district was able to participate in and then um, four out of five of our counseling members in our department at the high school have gone on to um, participate in the graduate level course, which is exciting um, because it's more resources that we all have to support um, students and families. Um, the diversity and um, equity inclusion training, as well as um, an abundance of the technology supports um, we have a really knowledgeable staff and they have made themselves very available for us to drop in and um, receive support as needed while we use incorporate more technology. Um, students are identified to receive social and emotional support at the high school um, through student a self referral peers or parent referral teachers or coaches and through one of the many systems or curriculums in place so that student support needing um, advisory help class etc and then this last slide is a visual highlighting some of the district-wide social emotional supports and how they are um, distributed to students so at the base of the triangle you can see um, some examples of supports that all students receive when they walk through the doors of any one of our um, Cape Elizabeth schools, um, or not even walk through the doors, students that are all remote. So um, some examples would be advisory um, at the high school or um, social emotional learning curriculum through health or um, trying to think like clubs and civil rights team at Pond Cove and the middle school. And then as you move up the triangle, um, these are some forms of support that um, might be more individualized based on need or request or suggestion. Um, freshman academy, academic skills, li the literacy, math, and executive functioning intervention at Pond Cove and the middle school, individual and group counseling or referral to outside providers. And then at the top of the triangle, we have um, 504 plans that are it's more of a formal plan provided as needed with documentation and a diagnosis. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And um, that concludes our overview of the supports that we've been offering. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really thorough and I am completely impressed with all that you provide and all that you, you do. Um, are there any questions from board members? Okay. Um, I just want to remind the public um, that we're done with, with um, the public comment period. I think there's been a hand raised here and there. And just as a reminder, um, we're moving on with the agenda. We do have a total of 307 participants. It's 31 panelists and 276 attendees. Moving on, we have the COVID update from Superintendent Wolfram. Thank you. Okay, so my COVID update 
tonight contains really four different parts. I'm gonna review part of a, a survey that we administered to parents and staff on March 10th, and it has been posted, but I think tonight would be, um, it would be good tonight to review this information. Um, also, um, a focus on the work of the district planning committee, um, options that were developed and uh, with, with some pros and cons for each, and uh, the schedule that, um, that Heather uh, reviewed with you, um, but you'll see it in print. And this is available on the website, um, the slide presentation. So one of the questions that was asked staff and we had 165 responses was about um, planning, did they plan to receive and complete the vaccination process? So 159 people or 79% of those responders said that they did plan to complete the vaccination process. <coughs> and 3% said no. Uh, thinking about when they felt that they would be fully vaccinated and keep in mind that this was on March 10th. So um, things have opened up quite a bit, but 23.8% said by the end of March, they thought they would be fully vaccinated. 37.5% by mid-April, 26.3% by the end of April, and then May or later uh, was 12.5%, but that, um, results in about 87.6% predicting that they would be fully vaccinated by the end of April. So that just gives you an idea. And of course, those are the, the um, results from those people that responded. So um, in thinking about um, increasing student time in school, although one of the options um, was not necessarily in school, um, in an effort to increase student time in school, would you prefer um, 75%, uh, 75 responses said that they would, uh, staff, prefer to maintain the current schedule. 34 said they would like to restructure classes to ac accommodate more students in class. And then 13 um, talked about returning to school all day on Wednesday, and only eight would want to return to school on Wednesday morning. Okay. For parents of hybrid students, and we were able to um, separate the survey into hybrid student, uh, parents of hybrid students and par parents of remote students, they had different questions to answer. 798 um, parents responded. Um, how well is your child learning and feeling about in-person socially distanced learning versus remote learning? So 42, there were 644 responses. 42 said, I see no difference in my child's learning and emotional well-being between in-person and remote. 98, my child is okay on in-person days, but some things could be improved. 14, my child is happier and learns more on remote days. 644 responded that my child learns more and really enjoys in-person days. For parents of fully remote students, and uh, we, have, we had 124 um, responses. And just for your information, we have 252 totally 100% rem uh, remote students. So 124 parents responded, remote, uh, parents of remote students. How well is your child learning and feeling about fully remote learning? My child's doing okay with fully remote learning, but there could be academic improvements. And that was 41 responses. 51 said my child is doing okay with fully remote learning, but there could be some social emotional improvements. 10 said my child is not doing well academically or emotionally with fully remote learning. And 22 said my child seems to be learning more and feeling happier as a fully remote student. So it's nice that 51 of those uh, parents um, thought that their child was doing okay with remote learning, um, but really was they were focusing on the social emotional um, need, which goes along with what everyone has been saying. Uh, what support would you need to improve your experience as a parent or guardian in the hybrid model? 
15 responses. There were 539 that said more in school learning time, which is interesting. Uh, 15 responded more academic support for my child. 42 responded they wanted more opportunities for sports, clubs, activities, either in person or remote. Seven wanted more emotional, social emotional support for their child. And 64 said they wanted more synchronous learning, that is with the teacher in real time on remote days. So overwhelmingly, people wanted more in school learning time. What support would you need to improve your experience as a parent or guardian of a student in the full remote model? Seven responded that they wanted more academic support for their child. 20 responded that they wanted more in-school learning time. 30 were more focused on opportunities for social engagement with peers. 11, more social emotional support for their child. And 29 wanted more synchronous learning with their teacher in real time. So we asked them, thinking about the remainder of the school year 2021 and childcare needs. Um, and these are um, for parents of, promote, of, of hybrid students. So they were interested in adding more time, more in school learning time, which might necessitate a change in student schedules. So that was 665 responses. So they were more interested in um, adding school learning time and um, it, it didn't seem to be a problem to change their student schedules. And then 131 preferred maintaining the same schedule. For remote student, uh, parents of students, uh, par parents of remote students, thinking about the remainder of the 2021 uh, school year and childcare needs, 39, reported that they would like to add more in-school learning time, which might, and it might necessitate a change in student schedule. So they were okay with that. 85 said that they would want to maintain the same schedule. The, the district planning committee met four times. Um, and this is just a, a really quick review of <clears throat> what was focused on in, in each meeting. These meetings, uh, there, were, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of material presented. So on March 16th, um, we just looked at a review of the work that had been done to date. Um, some of the changes in um, the guidelines and rules, uh, one being the in increased capacity guidelines, which really changed the um, changed everything for us, knowing that we could feed our students um, um, because of the increased capacity of our gyms and uh, cafeteria. The ventilation projects that had been done and are, are still in process. Vaccination availability was a change and then um, starting a discussion of possible options. Then on March 30th, there was a change by the CDC from six feet to three feet in social distancing. Uh, COVID testing was available in our schools by the nurses for uh, students and staff who were displaying symptoms. Uh, we had a presentation by Dr. Rosenthal and Dr. Santi on the risks and benefits um, of having more students in school and updates on more updates on possible plans on April 6th. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal did a, no, another presentation on student um, social and emotional risks. Um, there are, were some changes in the standard operating procedures by nurses, um, most specifically about um, uh, close contacts um, and the, the changes uh, from um, the, the area that they were looking at in the classroom, from whole classrooms to students within six feet and a review of possible plans by principals. And on April 8th, we had um, a half hour of breakout sessions that focused on what is best for students, report outs from um, various, the various groups, and then another review of options and uh, discussion. So some of the concerns that the district planning committee um, expressed um, 
they really felt that different schools might need different schedules, that one schedule might not work for all of the schools. So um, there was encouragement to look at different schedules, um, such as we really have a different schedule for the high school um, than Pond Cove and the middle school. Considerations for 100% remote students and time for teachers and staff to prepare for changes in schedules and classrooms. Uh, recommendations that we discussed were really, um, as Heather said, eliminating the option for just adding Wednesdays. Um, there was a discussion about that and um, it was felt that Wednesdays are really valuable days and um, uh, would really be needed, especially if we were making another change or, um, Option one was to maintain the, the present hybrid 100% remote learning schedule. And then option two would be to return to in-person learning four days a week. So with the, um, with the administrators, we looked at the, the different options and came up with um, pros and cons for each. And I'm not going to go over all of these, but um, they again, this is posted um, to look at um, really with option one, continuing with what we're doing, we're, we're in that schedule. Um, we feel that we can provide a, real, a pretty safe environment, as safe as possible. Um, but again, our students are only in school two, two days a week. Um, so that's less academic um, time with their teachers. And really we've listened to the concern about the social emotion and emotional risks. And then in option two with bringing students back four days a week, following main CDC guidelines, um, doing a, um, a roll-in, um, much like the roll-in that we did at the beginning of the year and in the fall, which we had such positive comments about, um, preparing students for the next grade, um, Keeping the Wednesday would be consistent with what many of the other neighboring districts are doing with their days off for childcare for our staff. Um, providing remote students with more opportunities to join in outdoor activities at school. So really trying to bring the remote students in um, to participate with, with, the, um, with the hybrid students to form a more cohesive group as they and make relationship as, as they prepare for next year. Um, part of the concerns about that would be, of course, the health concern, that would be the number one uh, concern that we would look at. Um, larger groups of students may be exposed and need to quarantine, and that's it's not an excuse, but it's a reality of what may happen. Um, may, it may not happen, but it may. Um, uh, we would have two different classes as one of the teachers talked about two different, uh, really two different classes in different places with different personalities coming together in the same, in the same um, classroom for the rest of the year. Um, and concerns about changing schedules at this point. Also, uh, transportation would only be provided for K through eight and for special education students because of the uh, social distancing requirements on the buses, we would not be able to transport um, our high school students unless they're special education students. Uh, legally, we must provide transportation for K through eight students. And then the roll-in schedule that Heather did go over, and I don't think I need to go over that again. Jen, do you wanna change it? Yeah, uh, but just, um, Starting on the first two weeks after vacation, just continuing with the same schedule, bringing students in with the same schedule and starting the roll in um, on the next week with um, no school for K to eight students on May 10th and 11th. Um, so the teachers can get their rooms set up and the planning for bringing all of the students back in. Um, continuing with, with Wednesday as usual and then on the 13th, doing starting the maroon cohort with any changes in scheduling that will need to be done. Um, and the 14th with the gold cohort again. So getting them used to um, a new schedule and then May 17th, just starting uh, with the full day 
for the rest of the year, continuing with the Wednesdays um, remaining in place. And then the high school schedule, as Heather said, with April 26th through May 7th, continuing with the hybrid schedule, and then May 6th, bringing in all of the seniors, continuing ninth to 11th grade with a hybrid schedule. Um, May 24th would be the four, uh, four day in-person schedule for ninth to 11th grade hybrid students. Um, and continuing with the Wednesday schedule as well. There's a little asterisk at the bottom that says the schedule could change due to COVID related issues and other details that may impact flexibility. And um, we'll see what happens. So thank you. Any questions? Elizabeth. Thanks, Donna. Thanks for going over all that. Um, I have a question that is kind of in a, a limbo area. What happens if we're designated yellow right after April vacation? So we haven't we haven't pivoted yet if, if the board chooses to go four days a week. Let's say we make that choice and um, we become a designation of yellow. Is is there an opportunity to just con continue with hybrid and not pull the trigger until we are designated green or does like, where do we fall well, with all this? Well, the hybrid designation says that we may consider hybrid. It doesn't say that we, uh, we will obviously for those two weeks have been scheduled to be in hybrid anyway. Um, but if, if the yellow continues, we would have to consider um, whether we wanted to stay in hybrid or we could choose to move into our four day a week, depending on what the situation is at the time. But um, the yellow designation does, do, is there is room for, <clears throat> for a choice in there, so. Thank you. Kimberly, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I had um, I had three questions. I think um, the so transportation at one point. I think um, my understanding was that transportation would only be available um, through the school for people who presently um, were being bused. Is that um, is that the case or has have there been shifts in guidelines that would allow us to take more students? Um, we, yeah, we were looking at only those students that were being bus now. Okay, um, and do we have a sense um, that the community has the capacity to transport their kids those additional days? I, I don't, I don't recall if that was part of any survey. It, it was not. We, we've had a lot of comments from parents, um, as you know, in emails saying that they would be happy to transport their students. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, if, there and, anybody, if there was anybody that had a real problem, we would certainly work, try to work with them. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, um, I had, I guess I had four questions um, about the remote students. Um, so we, it, it's spacing, um, if I understand correctly, that we don't have the capacity um, in, in the fall, we would be able to accommodate all students because we would be having the trailers. Is that kind of what we're looking at? And so, um, so in the fall, we could intend to accommodate our entire student population, but for the spring roll-in, um, we could not bring our fully remote students back in if they desired to do that. That is correct. Um, and so then just a different question. I think somebody had asked in the chat, I tried not to read them, but I did see, <laughs> see one question about wondering if the learning mode um, will shift for remote students um, the the way their um, I guess the way their access to education is going to be offered um, when we do this 
shift? Will will they have? Will things be different for students who are remote than they are presently? Um, they they shouldn't be very different except that they will have more access to their teachers. They'll have access to their teachers four days a week. Um, there may be some shifts. I know that Troy was working with um, Allied Arts and trying to make sure that those uh, remote students uh, would be served with Allied Arts. That would be a shift um, for the remote students. Um. And then if there are students who are presently hybrid, um, but if the board votes to go back four days a week um, and there's families or students who aren't comfortable with that and would like to switch to remote, um, are we able to accommodate that? And uh, uh, what does that look like, I guess? So that would be dependent on the capacity of the remote teachers. Um, you know, certainly we don't want to overload them because they do have um, their classes at this point. So it would be dependent on um, whether they had any room in their classes um, to make that shift as well as the opposite way. If when we get um, all of our hybrid students in and we find that we have a couple slots here and there, um, there would be a parents would need to contact um, the school offices and um, we could start a waiting list for people that might be interested in shifting with, with no promises, certainly. It, it would just be both ways, um, dependent on our capacity. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, and I think I had come up with one other question, but it's escaped me for the moment. Um, but, Thank you, and um, thank you for your detailed explanation of everything. I appreciate it. Hey, are there any other questions from board members? My question returned to me, but if anyone else has one, <laughs> yeah. they can. Go ahead, Kimberly. <laughs> um, so my understanding, and I may be wrong on this, but my understanding is, um, that if we um, if we roll ahead with um, the additional four days a week, um, that the schedules will be um, in the elementary and middle schools will have to shift quite significantly um, to a degree that we would not be able to revert to hybrid if um, for COVID reasons uh, that seemed like it would be prudent. Um, the, Am I understanding that correctly? The middle school schedule would sh shift very significantly. Um, once we got into it, we might be able to, we might find <coughs> shift, but it, it looks like it would be very next to impossible to shift. Pond Cove, difficult, but maybe. So I think the, the more, um, the more real situation that we would need to think about rather than worrying about the yellow situation, the state seems pretty committed to keeping everybody in green at this point, but um, would be, you know, needing to go remote for quarantining, you know, for a few days at a time. So I think that would be the, um, we would be looking at that probably um, more than going into the yellow at this point, so. so. I just wanna clarify that, Donna. If the board were to vote to go to in-person four days a week for hybrid students, the, the risk of a change would most likely be to a quarantining situation that would cause us to go to fully remote, but probably just for a few days as we deal with the quarantine, right. not a long-term remote. Right. And Quarant going to hybrid would be very difficult because the schedules have changed so significantly. Yeah, yeah. quarantining or um, uh, contact tracing okay. for, the short, for the short term. We've been very fortunate not to have many of those situations. Um, right. Um, Jen, I see that you have your hand up. Go ahead. Just a quick question, Donna. How many high school students are currently using our busing transportation? 
Um, I don't have that information and I don't know, if, Terry, are you on and would you have that? I don't have that. Um, uh, I am here, but no, I do not have that information with me as well. Cindy. Some questions about the length of the school day and the changes. Would there be, you talked about the middle school, I think having the largest impact and schedule change. Would the school day be any longer? Because I think right now our school day is slightly shorter than typical. Will we no, go back to the- No, it's nope, about the same. The same. It's okay. the high school, but no, it, we will keep the same schedule. Okay. I think there would be one group of students who are going to a daycare that would need to leave a, a bit early because the bus would take them and come back and then pick up everybody else. But that that would be really the only, as, as far as I know, that was our last conversation. That would be the only impact. Okay. And if we did have to go fully remote at Pond Cove in the middle school, what would that look like for students if we were to make the shift from where we are? Well, it would just be perhaps a class or two, maybe depending on, um, you know, if there was a if there was a student that tested positive and they had been um, in in school um, during a crucial time. Um, so you know, it could be a class. Um, it, it just basically like it is now. Um, you know, sometimes it's been a class. Sometimes it's been a situation with staffing, and we've had to um, go remote for a couple days. But um, and that my question was more about what would the remote programming look like if we were in a situation like a staffing situation, and we had to close the schools for a couple of days, or close the buildings, not close the, school, the, the close the buildings. Yeah, the teachers would um, uh, probably go into a, a Zoom situation with their classes. Mm -hmm. And then it may, look, it may look a little different at Pond Cove because it's harder with those kids. Um, more of the younger kids in child care situations where, um, you know, they don't they wouldn't necessarily have um, connectivity at a child care, um, you know, for many students. So we would have to we would have to work with that. Okay. And then on um, as far as remote students, I know we wouldn't be able to bring them all back in, but you note that there would be efforts to engage them in, in activities. Are there specific plans for that at each school or we're, how's we're, that work, we're working on that. I know that the uh, principals have talked about that. So okay. in fact, that's already going on at the middle school. Um, on Wednesdays, there's some activities that the remote students are participate, participating in, right, Troy? <laughs> So yeah, one of the uh, the seven eight team they meet on Wednesdays to provide some social time with them. So it's kind of the remote team only. They're meeting as a cohort, kind of, um, you know, and they're doing some, you know outdoor outdoor activities and, and things like that. So that stuff is definitely happening um, in pockets of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to clarify something. Sorry, that's the dog in the background, but. Um, for I think this is mostly for Jeff Shedd um, regarding that there was a comment earlier in the night um, about the length of the school day. And I know that the high school is ending around 1.30, but that's not a shift in the actual time. It's a shift in an achievement period that used to be in the middle of the day that is now at the end of the day. So it's, it, this year is no different than past years in academic time during the day. Is that stated correctly, Jeff? It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty close to being spot on, Heather. I would say we're actually, you know, if we had a 10 minute passing time to achievement period, which our passing time is right now and our normal length achievement period, which is 30 minutes, that would consume 40 minutes. So our, our class day is effectively about 20 minutes shorter Okay. now than it is in, in regular time the kids yes so that that's that's really the the loss of class time it's about 20 minutes a day okay and if we went back to full time or four days a week would that schedule change at all or the schedule would continue as it has been this year so the plan Cindy was to continue with the schedule that away it was if the mm -hmm. board wished us to add those 20 minutes back into the day, I mean, it, it, 
the, the challenge for that is, the particular challenge which causes me to hesitate is when we shifted to the mini term model, um, mm. what that meant is it created, number one, it helped us with the contact tracing and quarantining situation. So we could vastly reduce the number of kids who would be uh, quarantined if there was an issue. But as a result of that, the, the special ed team has adapted uh, to that mini term model uh, to use that hour after school, after 125, they actually have scheduled meetings with their special education students. That really is, is critical uh, to meeting the service needs that we owe to those students during the, during the many terms when their learning centers are not meeting or their regular support, regular otherwise scheduled time would meet. So it would, I mean, on the one hand, it's we're 20 minutes shorter but it, it would create a significant issue for students with IEPs and in terms of our ability as a school to meet the IEP needs of our students. So but we're remaining mini term for the rest of the year, correct? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Phil, are you all set? I saw you had your hand up for a minute. Did it get answered? Um, yeah, it did. That specific question. I did have one other and that was just um, looking at the <clears throat> schedule if we do go the four days for hybrid there would be the two days off for planning purposes do we are we planning to or we do we need to make those up at the end no. of the school year okay i know that the state has waived the number of days requirements is that partly why we, we would just essentially not provide those two days yes. Yes. okay okay uh kimberly and then jen Um, thank you. Um, so I, um, Phil's question just brought to mind another question about, um, is that all three schools that would be closed that Monday and Tuesday in May, or is it uh, Pine the, Cove and the middle school? Pay the eight, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, sorry. Yes, Pine Cove and the middle school. So just Pond Cove in the middle school. Got it. So the high schoolers would attend those two days and would there wouldn't be like, uh, they would not be remote days for the Pond Cove and elementary school. I mean, Pond Cove and middle no, school students. No, Correct. No. They would just be. Okay. Um, and then um, I had two other questions. Um, one, would we need to be staggering dismissal times at all to accommodate traffic? Particularly thinking of Scott Dyer. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Um, I will, I'll go. We definitely will have to stagger dismissal time. We think arrival might not be as necessary because it's kind of a drop off and it's kind of pull up and kids get out of cars and come in. Whereas pickup, you may be sitting there waiting for your middle schooler to say goodbye to people and get to the car. So, um, yeah, we definitely are working on some type of a staggered. And I think it's gonna have to be like off the top of my head, 20 minutes. So maybe two grades would be dismissed at, you know, two o'clock or just before that. And then, you know, 225 for us, the other grades. So, and if a student was riding a bus and their grade was dismissed, they would just stay in their, in their classroom and wait for the bus um, the whole time. So the bus dismissal, not a problem. The parent um, pickup just to save everyone's sanity. I think we would have to do a staggered dismissal. Thanks. Go ahead, Jen. I was going to wait because I'm not sure if Troy and Jason will address this, but can both of you talk a little bit about how the schedules are going to change for our special ed, RTI, and Title I kiddos? Because I know that um, if it's similar to where I am, you may have, you know, your special ed teachers that on Tuesdays and Fridays may have math students period five, but on Mondays and Thursdays, that same period five could be English, just depending on who they happen to have on their caseload. So how is this going to impact those students, their structure, their consistency, and their services? I know that SPED kids by law, we are required to provide those services, but the RTI in Title I services don't necessarily fall under that same umbrella. And I just wanna make sure that, you know, how their schedules are gonna be affected. Sure. Um... I could speak for, for Pond Cove. I actually was having that discussion with a special educator today. And so um, 
that will be an issue that we'll really have to dig deep into. Um, the uh, meeting those service hours um, it, because our allied arts schedule is set up in a way um, to maintain cohorts and not expose um, allied arts teachers to multiple grade levels in a day. So that makes it, long story short, it makes it difficult for special educators to um, work with groups of students that will come to them from multiple classrooms. Uh, so basically today, I just promised that special educator that if we're opening, we'll work together as a team and try to figure it out. Um, but it will be, that's an issue, but I, I'm not sure if it's something we can't solve. And for us, um, honestly, Jen, we are transitioning to basically our traditional seven block schedule that we would have in any other year. Um, that's why there are some difficulties with if we were asked to go and do a hybrid schedule, it just really wouldn't work because we'll be pulling all of our resources into the building. Um, currently, our allied arts teachers are working remotely, so kids have that remote Zoom contact every day. Um, to bring all the kids back, it will require basically our regular school schedule. So a seven block schedule, um, there's plenty of opportunity. The opportunity is in there to purposely and thoughtfully to support all of those students and all the needs. One of our major goals has been to not reduce um, the quality of our programming at any level. And so we have to maintain that the integrity of our programming. And um, the, the trick of it for the middle school is gonna be to make sure our special education teachers, our intervention teachers, um, they all have schedules in power school, so we can kind of ballpark it, but they'll get their eyes on it before it ever goes live. And they'll, they just have the flexibility to make the adjustments we have to for student placement during times of day. So I feel very confident that there'll be no reduction in that service. There won't be reduction, but those kids' schedules are likely to change, right? Um, all kids' Meaning schedules are change because we're going to go from a six block schedule to a seven block schedule. So everybody's <laughs> schedule will change, um, but that does not mean they will change their teachers. Uh, largely everybody will maintain their current teachers that they have. Potentially a few of our world language teachers may, may change for some kids. I'm talking hopefully a handful, um, just, just out of necessity. Um, but other than that, they will all have their same teachers, they'll have the same case managers. Um, all of that stuff will remain the same. Thank you, I appreciate it. Elizabeth. So I understand that we don't have our high school busing numbers right in front of us and, and that's fine. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if we can be mindful that, you know, if, if there's a, a, an adverse situation where a high school student really isn't able to get transportation to school that we would consider on a case by case basis, um, making sure that we get that student to school because we really don't want to be throwing barriers up for students um, that, you know, just for a lack of a ride to school can't get there. Yeah, Donna had mentioned, Elizabeth, that if there was a case that, that we could work with that. So, but thank you for bringing that up again and letting the public yeah. know just, as well. Yeah, I really wanna make sure- We don't want it to be a barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you bringing that up and mentioning that again. Okay. So thank you for all of that. We're gonna go on now to principals. Um, you have your time to report. Shall we start with Jason? Sure. Okay, so um, I had planned to uh, switch gears and um, not talk about COVID for my report, but kind of just talk a little bit about, um, that Joey mentioned earlier, um, some sense of normalcy. And so I wanted to talk about some standard things that we do and uh, a I have a couple items to share and then, and then a few thank yous. Now I will keep it very brief. Uh, so we currently, our numbers have gone up since um, our last, my last report. We have about 90 new kindergarten registrations. Um, so I'm really optimistic that we're going to be at a hundred or more because um, it's quite early. And I know that I'm getting some calls and emails from parents who are waiting to learn more about what school might look like next year before they register their kindergartner. So 
Um, we, it looks like we have a, a real healthy um, kindergarten population coming up, which is exciting. Um, we, we, we just love having them come in and we're, we're still in the planning process for kindergarten screening. Um, and we have some tentative dates, but that could change if we do open for more in-person learning. Um, we'll see. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. Um, also, another kind of standard process uh, in looking ahead and thinking about next year, uh, we're getting excited about um, our student placement process. And so um, we've started that for play, which we, we were going to start this week. Uh, with our placement process for the 21-22 school year. And the first step in that process, one of the very first steps is that I invite parents to share information um, with us, me and the placement team, um, regarding their child's uh, learning styles or anything that they think that we might need to know as we're creating uh, balanced classrooms uh, for next year. So we're excited about that. And we take that very seriously because it's it's our very first opportunity to set students up for success for the following year. Uh, so it's a, it's an important process. Um, it, and I wanted to, so I'll start my thank yous. First, I wanna thank um, the middle school staff. So teachers, um, the guidance department and the administrators for working so closely with us in the placement process. Um, as it relates to placing our rising fifth graders. And I know that um, we've, there's been a lot of work done with our fourth grade team and the fifth grade team at the middle school over the past few years. Uh, and I know that my, I can speak, I believe I can speak for my fourth grade teachers and that they are very pleased with the amount of collaboration that takes place. Um, working with the middle school, that makes us feel good to know that our, our rising fifth graders are going to be well taken care of. And, and uh, placed appropriately for next year. Uh, so thank you, middle school. Also, um, uh, just another a quick shout out to um, our Ponco Playground Committee. In particular, um, I've worked most directly with um, Lindsay Barrett. Um, she's a key member of the Playground Committee, um, very influential, has a great vision for our playground, um, as well as others on the committee. Um, and so we have had some recent additions, including um, a couple outdoor classroom spaces, um, outdoor seating, a new fairy village, which is a fairy house <laughs> village, which is, it's, I know it sounds kind of funny, but it is absolutely incredible for kids that love to build and create and kids that do not want to um, engage necessarily in sports or are not interested in the equipment. And these details are extremely important in the lives of those students. Uh, and it really um, just transforms their experience at school when they can engage in something they love um, out on the playground when they go. So thank you so much, Playground Committee and Lindsay. Um, and I'm gonna stop right there and keep it brief unless anyone has questions for me. All right, thank you so much, Jason. That's great to hear. Uh, Troy. So I'm gonna kind of piggyback what Jason was saying. I mean, honestly, springtime is a, I mean, every year in a school has its, every season has its own um, focus, you know, from welcoming students and working out the kinks to a schedule to focusing on budget and then moving into focusing on the, the upcoming year. And this spring's slightly different. We obviously have multiple focuses going on at one time. Um, but there is really a lot of work going on behind the scenes. And um, a big part of it for us really is placement of our students. Um, that takes a lot, of account, a lot of input into that. It's trying to work with the high school to ensure really the best transition we can um, for that group of kids and receiving the kids from Pond Cove. And um, we really have, we've got some nice systems in place working with each of those schools. Um, and, that, and it's really been a positive, I think some positive growth there for us. And I think our kids and families benefit. But largely, um, I just wanted to say it's, I know that there's a, a bit of a mystery always around what goes on in a school day. And it's kind of the secret between the teachers and the kids and, you know, parents aren't really there all the time. And, and this year, more than ever, it kind of has that sense of really being, you know, private. But I get the, the privilege of walking into most rooms. I get the privilege of seeing kids in there every day. And, and, you know, lately it's been science labs in the gym and dry ice and, 
you know, popping off, you know, um, beaker tops and, and watching some really cool things happen and just seeing the excitement in the kids' face has been, been a, a healthy dose of reality for me. And, and I think seeing the teachers, just this, the warm weather brings this positive energy. So um, our teachers have, have worked really hard. Parents have worked really hard to get to this point. Um, and I just, I look forward to, you know, coming up with some decision and moving on with it for the relief of the kids and the staff and everyone involved. Um, I think that, that we're all ready for that. And, and um, but it's been, it's been a unique year with the small class sizes to get to know the kids in a different way, to see the kids in a different way. It's been, it's been really um, a neat experience that I don't want to relive, but it's been a nice experience to see it, for, you know, one time. Um, so I just feel really fortunate to have, as you saw, the social worker teams at each building go above and beyond and our special education team and our interventionist team. You could just go on and on about how important each of those resources have become for us and how fortunate we are at CAPE to have all of those resources. This was a time where they were truly needed from the tech department to the custodials to the lunch, like everything has kind of had to come together. So I really appreciate that. Um, and with that, I'll just, if you have any questions, I can answer them or you can wait and ask me later. Um, but thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Troy. Uh, Jeff. I'm gonna stick with the non-COVID theme. Um, so last week, the state changed its guidelines about graduation. Um, and that's why we're able to have graduation at Fort Williams, weather permitting. Um, this, in fact, today, Mr. Carpenter and I went out to Fort Williams for our first scouting report to think through what we need to do to tweak things. It'll be mostly a very traditional graduation with some tweaks of the processional and recessional. Those are our big two biggest concerns and also some seating arrangement issues as well, just to maintain, make sure that we're complying with distancing. Um, so Troy mentioned this is every, every season has its thing. And, so today, Joe mentioned that uh, we had a whole bunch of juniors, 117 to be exact, show up as in school to take a three and a half hour exam completely as volunteers. Um, so that's 81% of our class. So that kicks off our testing season. Um, on May 5th and 19th, we're testing our juniors in the new uh, state required test, the NWEA and the science augmentation exam. Um, and then from May 10th to all the way up to June 9th, which is quite a bit longer than normal, um, our AP tests are being drawn out considerably almost until the very end of the year because the college board has made some, so extended the windows and provided a multiple options for, for test dates depending on what works best for schools and classes. So that is my report. If anybody has any questions. Thank you. Uh, Marcy, are you still with us? I am. There you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yes. Thanks um, for waiting. Yes, thank you. We are now in the last quarter for our fiscal year, and we are um, preparing to finish up the budget process, prepare for year-end accounting activities, and we will be beginning the audit in May. So that will be the last um, quarter activities for us. And at this point in the fiscal year, we are at 75% spent at the end of March. For our actual expenditures in the general fund, we are at 68%. So this is over the last five years, the average percentage spent has been 68%. No, I'm sorry, 71.2% spent. Mm. That's the average over the last five years. So we're a few points under the average. And for this year, the mean point range has been a five point range for the, since August. And this past month, we were at a seven point range. But again, um, I know that this gap will be closing as soon as spring sports expenses come in to the office for officials and coaches, as well as uh, completing our debt service payments that I know we just processed. And that completes my report, if there are any questions. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, thank you. Kathy, our Director of Teaching and Learning. Hi, good evening, everyone. I have two brief updates. Um, the first is about professional development. 
Um, the last district-wide professional development of the year was held on March 31st. As mentioned, Dr. Laura Blaisdell, a Maine-based pediatrician and public health expert, shared COVID-19 related research with the staff and answered their questions. Um, it was both informative and, and very reassuring. Uh, also professional development, um, information on the summer work application process will be shared immediately following the break. Uh, this year's priorities are going to be preparing for the five-day return to school in the fall and improving diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and then the other update is around the main educational assessments. Um, the, as mentioned last month, the, um, this year's MEA consists of the NWA for ELA and math for students in grades three through eight and 11, and the new Meridian Science Assessment for students in grades five, eight, and 11. Um, and all of those assessments are gonna take place in May, as Jeff mentioned, and the principals will be in touch with the specific schedule after the break. That's all I got for you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for hanging on so late with us too, Kathy. Really appreciate it. Uh, Dell, our Director of Special Services. There Thanks, he is. Jeff. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the Main State Alternative Assessment window opened up on March 15th and closes on May 14th. CAPE has students at both middle school and high school that are participating in this assessment. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to share with you, just to our current numbers, CAPE is servicing 169 students. Uh, we have one student outplaced and we have 14 students currently in referral. Okay. Thank you, Dell. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, so we are back to uh, Dr. Wolfram for her superintendent report. Okay, so um, I'd just like to congratulate the Cape Elizabeth Girls and Boys Alpine Ski Teams. They won the Western Maine Championship. So yay, that's um, great news. Uh, you have an enrollment update in your uh, packet. And just a, a short budget update because we're going to talk about budget in a, in a bit. Uh, but since our last, at our last business meeting, we were waiting our um, increase in our health insurance. And we did get word finally that the increase to our benefits would be 0% uh, increase. So we were able to drop our uh, budget uh, $344,261 as a result of that, um, that saving. So uh, that was good news. And we will hear more about the budget um, momentarily. Great. Thank you so much, Donna. Heading into some new business, uh, we have a notification of retirees and resignations. I'll just read them if that's okay. Um, our retirees are Linda Alfiero, a Pond Cove first grade teacher, Debbie Butterworth, a Pond Cove elementary school math interventionist, Mary Dulak, who is a Pond Cove uh, literary interventionist, um, Michelle uh, Gagne, Gagne, sorry about that, uh, Cape Elizabeth Middle School Administrative Assistant, um, and then Candace O'Brien, our um, Cape Elizabeth High School math teacher. We have a few resignations here. Uh, Montserrat Torres Salvador, our Cape Elizabeth High School Spanish teacher. Kathy Stankard, our Director of Teaching and Learning. Noel Haraf, our Director of Technology. And Perry Schwartz, our Director of Facilities and Transportation. Um, I just want to say thank you to all, that every single one of the retirees and the people leaving the district um, has given this district the, all the ways that you have served, um, shown up and um, contributed. Um, and I wish everybody the best of luck um, on their new adventures. Goodbyes are never easy. Um, so do we have a motion 
for the first new business item. I move we approve Maria Randall for the high school math teacher position. And a second. I second. Kimberly. Uh, is there any discussion or comment? Is, is this replacing Mrs. O'Brien who's retiring? Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank any, you. Yeah. Any more discussion or comments? Okay. Uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volz. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, so consideration to act on recommendation by the district planning committee. May I have a motion? I move we act on the recommendation by the district planning committee. I have a second. I'll second it. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, Which recommendation are we? That's just exactly what I was you. gonna say. So I am gonna, um, I'm gonna rephrase that. Um, and I think that the recommendation will be to go, uh, since it's a new, um, the new, um, path or the new way of teaching, let's say um, the recommendation to go with four days a week in person learning um, for hybrid students. So that will be the motion, the recommendation to go with four in person days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for hybrid students starting based on the schedules that were presented earlier and the information that was presented earlier. So is that clear? Do we need to re-motion that, Donna? Or are we good? Uh, probably, you should- I can do it again. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Laura. I move we act on the recommendation by the district planning committee to go to four in-person days for hybrid students. Days we have a second. Days a week, okay. Days a week, yep. days a week. I can Not second that again. Okay, so discussion for board members. I suppose I'll start. <laughs> Somehow I always kick it off, but I'll start. And a lot of times um, my fellow board members know that I like to be con extremely concise, but I do feel I owe it to the community and fellow board members to really understand my decision-making process. So for me, voting back four days, um, I feel like that's not a decision I'm making alone because it's really backed by science and it's well thought out by leaders. So it really, for me, it rests on the following. The fact that we can follow the guidelines of the main CDC and the main DOE. I appreciate remeasuring the classrooms to know that we can maintain that three foot distancing guidelines, which is critical. We're also designated as green. You've heard um, the director of the main CDC, Dr. Shaw say many times, he stated that children are safest in school. The majority of the physicians in our community support more in-person days. Um, even if you go as high as it's the will of the president that children are in school. And, um, and also the fact that as a board member, I support the community and overwhelmingly the community based on even the survey feedback based on all the letters I've received, based on numerous conversations I've had with community members, want our students in school. So with that being said, I realize that it's not easy. And I hear the folks that say, you know, sort of what's the point? So little school left, is it really worth it? And for that, I say it is worth it. So any additional days in school, no matter the quantity, I think it's, it's a win for our students. And also I feel like it is this, this welcome change will provide families, parents, the confidence in returning full-time in the fall. I know we're saying that, you know, we are going to return full-time in the fall, but this change, I think, is the confidence that the community at large needs. Thank you, Laura. That was thorough, but still concise. 
Well, well, thank you. I don't know if it's a <laughs> minute, 30 seconds, but I tried. I tried to follow our own guidelines there. Anyone else from the board? Go, oh, and I'll try to be concise. And, um, you know, we've received a lot of letters in addition to public comment. And I keep going back and forth. And this is such a hard decision that I think no matter what we do, it's not going to meet the needs of every family and every student. And there were a few things that have resonated with me. And one of them was uh, an email that we received from a parent saying, we're doing okay, but I'm worried about the kids that are not, the kids that don't have remote um, support at home. And I thought that was fabulous sense of community. There was somebody that talked about one less loneliness with four days, um, one less abuse, one less hunger. But I myself, I guess, Laura, I, I'm in a very different mindset is, is that there is a lack of equity, I feel like, with the decision that's being made. And we have 252 remote students, and that's 16% of our population, and we're not offering them the same. We have had students that have gone from remote to hybrid, and these students are now being told that they are not given that opportunity. And continuing with that sort of inequity is, is that, yes, they're going to have probably opportunities to come in, but that's going to require parents bring them in. I have concerns about the high school busing, um, and I just, I struggle with the equity in terms of um, providing that learning equity for all of our students, the, the structure, the consistency, the routine. Um, we're changing schedules for all of our students, but our special education staff and our special education students are going to be impacted. Our ELL students are going to be impacted. Um, when <clears throat> I know that the administration has done an amazing job at the middle school and we're now only looking at issues with world language, but we're going to take a, even if it's a handful of kids, we're going to take them and we're going to put them with a new world language teacher that may be in a different part of the curriculum, maybe doing something entirely different. Um, and I struggle with that. And Jill Young, I hate to call you out on this, but you said it perfectly in for five out for 10. It's the optics of being in school full time but the number of quarantined kids that we may end up with. And for high school students, that could be sports, that could be work, that could be social engagement. And I think that that's gonna be a detriment to many of our kids. And I do struggle with the, it's 10 days of in-person learning that we're talking about, and it's disrupting the structure and the routine of what kids have, have, have had. You know, Somebody said it perfectly to me today. Last year, we ended the year without any structure and stability. At least with a hybrid model, we can end the year with structure and stability for our kids that we did not have last year. I hope I was concise. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Phil. Yeah, thank you. And I thank you to both Laura and Jen for those comments. There's sort of things that go back and forth in my mind. I'm going to vote to go back four days. And uh, I also uh, feel like I need to describe why, although Laura really said almost bullet for bullet what I was going to say. So I can sort of say me too to, to what she said. But I do want to add a couple things. Um, I do think that there's some validity, and I've done a lot of thinking about this, about the transition and providing a transition back to what will be in, unless something happens five days a week in the fall. And I think that four weeks, even four weeks is, is something that is important. My daughter's a kindergartner and she's had an excellent year. So I, I, for speaking for myself, my kids are doing fine. But I know a lot of kids aren't and a lot of parents don't want more. And, and it's not about my children, it's about the larger community. And so that's where I'm coming from. But I only bring up my daughter because she is doing fine and she's had an excellent education educational teacher but she thinks that school is two days a week with eight kids you know and it's going to be a real shock to throw her into a five-day room um, without any kind of ramp up period and I, that's that's the one thing I am thinking personally about and I actually think a transition even uh, would be a good thing for some of those kids and I don't think it's just the kindergarten um, I do think it's a number of other students who, because um, uh, change, is, change is difficult. And so I think it's good to, to try to move, move this process along and introduce a larger classroom uh, to kids, even if it's going to be a little bit of a struggle. Um, 
I also think uh, we have an obligation as a public school to provide as much in, in person education as possible, um, given the science. And I think we have been entirely appropriate in this process we have taken and the timing we have taken. So I take some issue with some commenters on that. And I want to say that for the record. Democracy can be a inefficient and messy process, but it's by design. And it requires a long process of deliberation to ensure that people buy into the process and that we collectively come to a decision. We don't make decisions from top. Um, and this has been necessary. This entire process has been necessary. It's been necessary for teachers to hear from Dr. Blaisdell. It's been necessary to have a planning committee. It's been necessary to have the parents um, uh, advocate um, and speak to us. So this is this is not something we could have turned on a dime three months ago, and nor should have we. So I I think that we are where we are because this is where we are as a community, and uh, and this is what it, this is how long it's taken to get some people, and we need to meet people where they are. Uh, so th so that's where I am, um, and I respect people who feel differently, but but I do think it's an obligation that we have to bring kids back. I do want to say one final thing, and that's just um, about our teachers, because the one thing that, um, quite frankly, has upset me um, by some commenters, and people have been very respectful tonight, and I think the last few weeks, but that has not always been the case. And I don't think it's appropriate in a community where we need to work together. Um, and we are a close community, and we're a great community, but we, we need to stop pitting people against each other and questioning people's motivations for where they come from. And where I see it the most, and I don't care as a board member, I mean, we've got the big shoulders, uh, we put ourselves in these positions. Teachers are doing their jobs. Um, we should not be questioning their work ethics, their ethics, their desire to go back to work. Um, and, so, and that's been one of the most upsetting things that I've seen. So I'm voting four days a week even though I know a lot of teachers have told us they're not ready. And that's, and that is upsetting to me. And I, and I wish that wasn't the case, but I want to, I, I just want to recognize that perspective that we've been given from the teachers, um, even though I'm coming to a different conclusion. Um, so that's all I have to say for now. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. I'll go. Um, and I, this has been a difficult decision for me too, but I do, I'll, I'll say up front, I am in support of going back for the four days. Um, this is a, it's especially hard to make at this time when we are experiencing our first outbreak in one of our schools, we're seeing numbers rising, um, but we're seeing, not only are we seeing case counts rising, we're seeing vaccine rates heading up. And that gives me more comfort. I. I share the concerns that, that Jen expressed about the remote learners and um, the busing situation and making sure that students will have equitable opportunities. Um, but you know, the points Phil and Laura made are, are also right on. I, I think we um, owe it to our community to have our kids in school as much as we possibly can. We're following the guidelines, we're following the um, main DOE, you know, green designation. We're following the doctor's recommendations. I don't think we could have made this decision more carefully or with any more information than we've had. Um, I'm very appreciative of all the community engagement and the community feedback that we've received. Um, and I'm grateful of, to have been a part of the planning committee and um, to experience, uh, to, to get that information firsthand as well. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, I'd like to start off by echoing what Phil ended with, which is um, I have been deeply disappointed with um, some of the, the rhetoric out in the community and social media and that sort of thing, um, the negativity toward teachers and teachers union. We work in a, co a collaborative, positive way with our teachers union. It's not that when you, when you slander the teachers union, you're slandering teachers in our community. And, and 
I'm, I'm just deeply hurt by that. So I, I, I'm reaching out to our community to say, let's do better. And it has been better, feels right, over the last couple of weeks. And I'm reaching out to our teachers to say that um, this board supports you, this board member, this mother supports you and, and is appreciative of everything. The schools have not been closed and the teachers have not been uh, out of work. The teachers have been working very hard. And to make this new plan, which I am in favor of, this four day a week plan work, they're going to have to pivot and work hard some more. And I recognize that. And I recognize that it's not going to be easy. And I, I honor their opinions, even though it, it may not be the conclusion that they wished that um, I come to. I, I heard every teacher's opinion that, that voiced it to us, as well as hearing every community member and parent that voiced their opinion to us. And um, where I land is, the, you know, in the same place that, you know, Phil, Laura, Cindy, we are a public school, we are governed by the main DOE, and we are now, only now, not, not before, but now we are able to meet those requirements. And we needed to follow that process. We needed to figure things out and hear everybody's ideas and suggestions on how to do this once we were given that go ahead around um, indoor gathering limits and social distancing requirements. So now we are at the place where we can make this decision um, and we can meet the requirements. And as a public school, I think we are bound to do that. We need to bring our students back. And I, I just want to say everybody, I hope, has their eyes open and understands that there is a possibility and none of us have crystal balls, but bringing people back, bringing the students back in full time, obviously from a statistical analysis standpoint would mean that there's a higher likelihood of quarantine. That's just, that's just how it works. There are over 570 new cases in Maine today, things are on the rise at the same time that vaccines are on the rise. We don't know, but I think everybody needs to understand, have their eyes open and hopefully not complain when we have to go remote or something like that, that you know, we're all going to do our best and work together. Thank you. Um, I would like to, I guess, start um, just by um, thanking the community members for, um, for all the communication we've received. Um, I've read um, every single email, um, every comment, um, some not as respectful as others, <laughs> but read every single one. Um, and it's a, it's a hard decision. I think I struggle a lot with the inequity um, that we're not able to accommodate our remote students this spring. Um, and I also uh, recognize that this is a really hard time um, for a, a majority of our population. Um, I've um, watched my family unravel at times through this um, pandemic. It's, it's been hard on everyone. Um, and I, I think there's no single right solution. Um, you know, I have five kids and, um, and I think that they would each benefit from a slightly different scenarios. Um, so that's within one household. I know that, you know, we're, we cannot accommodate everyone's, um, everyone's needs. So there's, there's no perfect solution. Um, I think, um, you know, just listening to all that is going on in the schools this spring, um, I am particularly sensitive to the extra work that we're asking of um, the principals and the teachers um, by putting students back into school for four days. Um, 
And I, I think at this point, um, I, I think that that, I, that is where I land. Um, I, this is a decision I've really struggled with. Um, um, you know, I, I think that there's potential for significant um, impact on our, on our anxious students returning, you know, sort of essentially having a first day of school in mid-May. Um, so I, I guess that um, I would just ask that we, as a community, are good to each other, are good to our teachers, are good to our students. Um, we, you know, I think this is a community of people who care tremendously, um, who are passionate, and I just ask that that um, come out in, in kind and supportive ways um, so that we can build stronger together. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I want to start by thanking my fellow board members that um, through multiple conversations, I know they have spent countless hours um, and energy thinking this through. Um, this is no doubt a hard decision because each and every one of us signed up to be board members, as Phil said, right? Um, but none of us signed up for this kind of role as a board member. Um, and that's not to, you know, get us off the hook, but to just say that um, the responsibility weighs very heavy, I think on each and every one of us because we care so deeply. And I think part of the reason that is so difficult for us, and I'll start to speak for myself right now, but um, I would wage a bet that it's true across the board with all seven of us is that we've come to the realization um, that we, we can't do our best because we cannot serve. There's no, there's no good answer for every student. Um, there's not even close to that. Um, and so we are going back and forth, each and every one of us, I believe, saying, well, I think this, but then I think this. And then there's a counter with this argument, and then there's the counter back with the next argument. Um, and I think many board members as well are struggling with, I know how I would vote personally as a mother or a parent or a taxpayer. And then there's how I vote as a board member considering my responsibilities, which each and every one of them here takes very seriously. Um, and so that's how I will be voting from the perspective of not a parent here. My kids, um, you know, are, are hanging in there. They're, they're high school kids. Um, they're not elementary school kids. And I've said since the beginning, I think that must be incredibly challenging. Um, so I feel grateful. We've had our moments for sure, but I, I feel grateful. Um, I am doing my best to think, how do I vote um, with the consideration for what's for best for most students, because I recognize that we can't serve all students right now. Um, and it pains me and it's difficult. And I recognize that we can't even provide for students if we don't consider our staff and teachers and administrators. And um, my heart aches when I read some of these emails that say how difficult this year has been for the people that are working so tirelessly to provide the best they can for our students. Um, it just really is remarkable and honorable and they are heroes, each and every staff member here in Cape Elizabeth to me. Um, and I really struggle with all of that. But when I try to weigh um, everything that's come and I think about our responsibilities as, um, as board members, which is to provide 
in-person education as best we can and that we were set with a task to follow the guidelines. Um, I will be voting to go to the four day a week. Um, so that's where I stand. Um, and it is not without reservation. And um, Elizabeth had mentioned that she hopes that people have their eyes wide open. Um, I want to add to what she was saying about that in regards to um, four days a week in person is not gonna look the way we may think. It is not going back to normal. It's gonna be very different from how it was before the pandemic still. Um, and I think people are aware of that, but I just think it's worth reiterating. Um, the one thing I do wanna add um, is it sounds like we are going back um, or the vote is gonna go that way. Please, please, please take an emphasis off of the academics and put a focus on the fun. We're bringing kids back in four days, which is something they have not had. And we want to make sure that it's fun. It's going to be starting school all over again. It's going to be establishing communities and routines. And the less emphasis we put on academics, the easier it's going to be for our staff and our students. So please know that these last three weeks, treat them like field day, treat them like fun and recognize that it's the social aspect that we really need for our kids. Thank you for that, Jen. And I would also like to, um, you know, send a message to the teachers that um, I, I know that teachers give 120%. It's just, if you're a teacher, that's what you do. You care enough. Um, and I just wanna invite you to take a little pressure off yourselves as well, to maybe go in at 110 instead of 120, or maybe even 90%. Um, give yourself a break um, and make it sustainable um, as best you can. And I know that's a big ask, um, but I'm gonna make it. Are there any other comments or questions? I'll, I'll just, I, I think, um, I think those are both great points. And I think, um, you know, so much of what we heard from our teachers was, was not about concern for themselves, having the students come back. It was concern about um, what was the absolute best for the students in this year. And, um, and you know, I think that the concern for the students is at the core of everything that they do. And like you said, they give 120%. And, um, and I, I want our fabulous teachers to be with us next year and the year after. And, um, and I think self care is part of that. And if, um, if that means that, you know, there's a little less that happens the last four weeks in the school, um, but you can come back refreshed in the fall, then, you know, I, I think that that's, that's something that, that I could endorse. Okay, it looks like we're ready to vote. So Heather Altenberg, <laughs> Just to remind everybody, because it's it's written not the way we're voting, but we are voting to go back to the four days in person for the hybrid students. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh. Nay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion for item D, please? 
I move we approve the director of technology job description. Second. A second. Was that Elizabeth? Thank you. That should be the director of educational technology. Yeah. Director of educational technology job description. Um, Donna, do you need to say anything about this? We've talked about it quite a bit. I so think. Maybe, maybe Cindy wants to jump in as well, but okay. um, with with the um, the separation of the the town and the, the educational piece, um, that the director of technology piece, this is creating and um, this create describes the new position that we're just that we are creating, and we did involve the technology team um, in this conversation. Um, they had lots of ideas and we, we um, added things and took things away and um, it was a real group uh, a group um, discussion and um, agreement in what should be in this job description. So I don't know, Cindy, if you want to say anything else about it, but. No, I think you covered it. I think it's important because we also have um, and approval for the uh, technology integrator job description on here as well. And part of what we did as we went through the job descriptions, we sort of read through the role of the technology integrator as well and made some adjustments um, to uh, the workload uh, for both positions, considering that there's a new role in place. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? I just think it's a, a great opportunity to take as we have kind of that turnover in that position to refocus. So thanks, Donna, and thanks, Cindy. Okay, Heather Altberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Ben McVeigh. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Uh, may I have a motion? I move we approve the technology integrator job description. May I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, Cindy, are you involved with this? Do you want to go ahead or Donna? Well, I think Cindy just talked about this one as well. So it's enough? Yeah, yeah. and it was um, the technology committee looked at the um, at this job description and um, tweaked it a bit based on the changes in the director of educational technology. Um, Great. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jan McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Next up, uh, may I have a motion? I approve, I move we approve the FY 2020 school budget. I second that. All right, Phil. Well, thank you. Um, this is the school budget and Marcy's gonna help me with a uh, slideshow uh, briefly. It's a brief slideshow, but I wanna um, say a couple words first. This is a process um, that we've arrived at due to the really, I'd say the strong and helpful work of the superintendent and the business uh, administrator and the principals and the rest of the administrative team. And we couldn't have done it without them. I'm exceedingly proud, as proud as you can be of a budget. Um, it's, it's a role I just stepped into this year and I didn't think I would love this, but I do love, love working on this process. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, but I particularly am happy about where we ended given where we are with um, the conversation we just had, quite frankly, in COVID and return to schools and the challenges we have. Um, I think this is a budget that um, I think we're all proud of. We had um, four budget uh, 
question and answer periods uh, over the course of uh, four, three months. Um, we started this way back in, in January with a joint workshop between the town council and school board to discuss our goals and the budgeting process. Um, we, had a, we had an original budget request workshop and I'll talk about a little bit what was presented there. And then we went on to meet, as I mentioned, for another four meetings. Um, another, another part of the process that's been very helpful is that the, I and my role as budget finance chair and our, and our school board chair uh, meet once a month with the town council chair and the town council finance chair, along with the superintendent and the town manager and the budget directors. Um, to make sure that we're really understanding where we are as a community and where the budgets that, uh, will eventually be. Um, it's really our town's budget at the end of the day, although our, our portion is a significant portion of it. So it's been a good process. And I think what, where we've ended up is it's a targeted budget, um, but it makes key investments um, that allow us to go back to school five days a week in the fall, which is one of the budget goals we have, um, while keeping um, the tax impact as low as possible. So Marcy, if you go to the next slide. Um, and I know a lot of the board has seen this, but for the public, where we, where we started back in January was which was called an original budget request by the administrators. And uh, that would have um, included um, some items that you'll see below, which uh, we have a nutrition deficit, which is um, not unusual to Cape Elizabeth. We actually do this is an issue that we're a little bit better at, but it's a significant, it's a, I don't know if you call it a systemic issue, but it's, it's a structural issue with budgeting and nutrition and it's something we're working to provide, to address. But that budget included the, the existing overall deficit of, of the school nutrition deficit, our concept design for our new school projects, which I know that our community will be hearing a lot more about um, in the next coming months. Um, and uh, included all new position requests. We'll go into what those are. Um, and a contingency fund of $100,000. That would have resulted in expenditure increases, as you'll see above, to the budget itself of 7.4% over last year with a percent of property tax, uh, the school portion of the property tax would be 7.3. So that's where you start. That's where you start with what you think you're, you need, but we obviously, over course of number of meetings, refine that and get that number lower. So you can get to the next slide, Mercy. So this is where we ended up after a number of uh, meetings. Um, what's included in this, in this budget that we're pr presenting tonight um, is we're reducing half of that nutrition budget um, of what we owe, $146,255. Um, we worked with the town council to provide a short-term finance option to fund the concept design. The interest rates on, on financing are so low right now, under, uh, under 2% is what we're getting for quotes in the 1% range, I believe. Um, that that made a lot of sense and uh, any residual fund of the bond can be rolled up into a larger construction bond um, if, if the community supports that. So this was a way really to manage our cash flow and to assure that we had the funding um, that we needed to uh, open up five, day, five days a week in the fall. We were also helped, quite frankly, as, as uh, the superintendent mentioned, that our health insurance uh, uh, increased, which we had budgeted 10%, dropped to zero. Um, we, we, we got down to 4% at one point and now and then it got to zero. So that was obviously very helpful. And we, we decided at our last meeting to put that towards uh, property tax reduction. So we ended up lowering the percentage increase of the tax rate um, instead of putting into additional funding. Um, the administrators and the board reviewed line items for projected expenses and decreased the budgets. We did increase the contingency fund to $247,000. So that's, that's a savings account essentially. And we did that for the purposes of maturing that we have enough funding to go back to school five days a week. Again, that, assuming that we need to have the same space concerns. So this would pay for um, uh, trailers and additional uh, expenses. expenses. Um, and we, we increased our fund balance use to $740,000 to assist us in these expenses and to lower the tax rate. Um, I do want to just mention, I don't, I think it's on the next slide. Uh, we are getting a little bit of money from the American Rescue Plan. Unfortunately, not as much as we expected. So the money that we have in, for going back to school includes that contingency of 247, but also uh, just over 200,000 or so in grant funding from the American Rescue Plan. Um, and so we think that we are in good place there, along with the potential for reimbursement for certain physical, uh, physical costs through the main department of education's funding. Um, so that's what this budget is doing. This budget also includes, um, you can go to the next slide, I think it's on the next page. 
Uh, okay, so this is the funding sources. So you'll see where our funding uh, from the state, we obviously don't get very much compared to so many of our, uh, our neighboring communities. Um, we use some of our fund balance for property taxes is, is 27.2 million and some other revenue. Um, outside of that is this COVID relief fund. That's what I was just referring to. So that is something that we're holding on to for now. Um, we were able to include um, some positions in our budget through our general fund uh, that we're going to fund um, for math interventionists at all three schools, which are directly related to COVID, um, the COVID pandemic, and ensuring that our students have what they need when they come back. Um, and we felt we needed to say, use this money for additional um, additional expenditures that may come up. So we prioritize those educational opportunities. Um, next slide. So these are the new positions that we were able to, um, that were requested and we were able to um, include even with that low rate um, of tax increase. Um, you'll see there's math interventionists at both, at all three schools and that's really, really in response um, to the hybrid learning and uh, well, the pandemic. It's, uh, and then um, you'll see some, uh, a few smaller positions um, is, uh, 0.1 art teacher, 0.4 computer teacher, and EL teacher, 0.5, and so on. Um, it, again, I think this is very targeted. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's not a, it didn't add a, not a lot of positions, and the three full time positions are are related to back to school for the, because of uh, COVID. Uh, last slide. This is a overview to show people, uh, members of the public, and I don't blame you if you haven't been at all of our meetings, but I thank you if you did come, uh, to show you the work we did over the over the period of a uh, number of meetings. So you'll see at the very top, that was our first slide, you see where we started. The percentage increase was gonna be 7.4% with a 7.3% increase to the property tax based uh, in our budget. And that slowly went down over time where we ended up, and you probably can't see the last one because where our pictures are, but, um, but uh, where we are in the three range. I, I just wanna say that that rate is the lowest, lowest increase in expenditures in three years. Um, and it is the lowest portion, lowest school portion of the tax increase in four years. And that's all happening during the COVID pandemic and with none of the funds in this budget from any kind of grant funding. So I, again, I very proud about, I don't know if we have one more slide or if that was the last one. Well, there you go. There's a nice quote. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. So that's where we'll end it. Um, that's a very high level snapshot, but all of the materials for the budget are online um, in our various meetings, including this meeting. Um, if you want to dig into the details and, um, you know, assuming we approve this tonight, I'll be presenting this in front of the town council on the Monday after uh, break. So that'll be some fun planning to do over that time period. But. Any, thank you, Marcy, for, for running that. Uh, any questions? Okay, well, that's that's all I had on that. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. I just wanted to say thank you to both Phil and Marcy and the administration because going through this process for the first time and watching it start so high and come down, and Marcy, I don't know if this has gone through that program that works its magic before it gets to the... Um, the actual voting um, from town council, I think you said there's some magic that still happens, um, but I just wanted to put a giant thank you out there for all of you because this was a great first experience for me and just really seeing how it works. Thank you and um, I thank everyone I should have, except for Elizabeth because I, Elizabeth has done this for many years and that, that she is who I was, it was my first year last year and I watched Elizabeth do it and I know she'd done it for many years so, and she helped me a lot this year in this new role. So thank you to Elizabeth as well. I wanted to chime in and tell you what a fantastic job I thought you did, Phil. So um, this was wonderful. And Marcy had this, I think you just improve year after year and this process has been fantastic. And I too am so incredibly proud of this budget and it is fun. I agree with you, Phil. Um, to see the work that goes into it and the way the puzzles all the pieces just fit together is is really extraordinary. The work that the administrators and Donna put into this, I, it's fantastic. And um, I am incredibly supportive of this budget. It meets the needs of all our students. It takes the pandemic into consideration. It's incredibly conservative and lean and it's, it's creative. We have found a way to do 
what we really need to do. So I'm so proud of this board and this entire team. And by the team, I mean everybody in this school department. Um, I wholeheartedly support this budget and hope everyone else does too. Yeah, I want to echo, echo what Jen said too, uh, as a first time through the process, but having watched it um, as a member of the public, it it was a lot less painful. In fact, it was painless. <laughs> it was a lot um, much easier than than I expected it to be. Um, and it, I, I think, goes to you know, your preparation and the work that you did um, to coordinate and communicate and walk us through the meetings and walk us through all of the the information and I appreciate the work that went into it and all of the preparation that took. Um, it was it was very helpful and um, felt felt easy um, you, and you made it that way. So thank you. You're here. I just did what everybody says. <laughs> Instead of speaking up, I'm just gonna ditto for tonight. Okay, so getting ready to vote here. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVay. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Great, may I have a motion please? I move, we approve policy DJF, school nutrition, procurement, procedures, and code of conduct. May I have a second? Second. Elizabeth, would you like to speak? Uh, this policy was brought to the board last month for our first read. Um, the only changes that were made were we had to insert local amounts for particular uh, dollar amounts and purchases. So there has been no substantive change to this policy. Um, no feedback really given from the board around this. Um, I'll just remind people that this policy was um, requested of us by Peter Esposito, our school nutrition director to, um, he needs to have this in place, especially for working and ordering with our um, Greater Sebago Education Alliance Collective and I, I believe it also aids him in certain grants procedures. So that's what this one's all about. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Heather Altmerg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McVeigh? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Elizabeth, would you like to talk to us please about first readings? Yes. So up for first read, I'm gonna talk about two together because one is a procedure and one is the policy. So the first one is a retitling of education of students who are homeless, formerly known as education of homeless students. It's um, just a, a philosophical change in, in referring to people as, you know, the person first and the whatever kind of designation second. That's um, JFABD and then JFABD-R. It's a mouthful. Um, really, we wanted to revisit these. They haven't been revisited since um, 2015 and um, really just a tiny freshening of language. We're looking at our procedures and they do match um, legal requirements and what we actually do in the district. So it's, it's just a little freshening up. Great. And then if I can, you wanna just move on, I'll move right on. Mm -hmm. I believe we have one more, which is um, dropout prevention administrative procedure. So that is JFC-R. We have a dropout prevention committee that um, involves a board member and um, the procedure is, um, it is, it matches what we do. And I would say that 
um, in our school, we probably go even more. We go the extra mile. We, it, to quote Jeff said, we sort of, we throw everything at them. We do anything we can to make sure that that student stays in school. So um, this procedure just kind of documents what we do and, and how committed we are to, to, to make sure that our students stay in school and graduate. Great, thank you for that. Uh, moving on, are there any school board agenda requests? All right, uh, committee reports. Uh, Cindy, would you like to start with paths? Uh, yeah, uh, the paths meeting uh, last month actually was very interesting. It was a presentation of the career and technical education visioning report. And you'll see that in the meeting materials online. Um, the report was a result of an 18 month review that was launched by PATHS and the Westbrook Regional Vocational Center. And their review process was designed, I, I wrote a little bit about this, the review process was designed to celebrate the success of each school, identify future directions for programming and renew a vision for career and technical education in our region. So the findings of their process led to the development of a blueprint for future career and technical education programming that will engage students and provide them with multiple pathways for college and career success. So I had, um, like I said, Jen upload the report and I would really recommend reading it. It's only seven pages long, but it has a lot of information packed in there, a lot of really valuable information. I think that we can use to support our district goals for multiple pathways and definitions of success. So it's a, it's a very interesting report. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Elizabeth, do you have more to add to policy or are you good? I'm good. Policy committee is the last Monday of the month at three o'clock and open to the public. Thank you. Great. Um, for DEI, <clears throat> the last meeting got canceled because people needed a breather. Um, and so I really don't have much of an update um, to give because the one before that I couldn't happen to be at. And I believe it was quite small and just an intimate conversation if I'm remembering correctly, Kathy, from what I heard. I look forward tomorrow, we uh, have our next meeting and um, I look forward to, to, to being a part of that tomorrow. So, um, and then next up is the superintendent search committee. Um, so the search committee um, is no longer needed because um, we are uh, having a special business meeting on Thursday to um, with one agenda, two agenda items, but one is um, for the vote to potentially hire a candidate. Um, the name is not public quite yet, just uh, out of respect for the candidate to be able to talk to some of the folks in uh, the home district. So um, we're coming to a conclusion with that. Um, and I'd like to thank all the people that participated uh, in the interview, the superintendent search committee, um, board members for all of your participation, um, Elizabeth, um, for all the detail work that you contributed to this process. Thank you so much. So that's very exciting. And then Cindy, if you'd like to speak about technology committee. The technology committee meeting, most of the meeting was working on the two job descriptions that we approved earlier. And then the committee is also um, working on, we talked about just things that work that they could begin now that would help a new director of educational technology hit the ground running. So um, the school teams are already working on sort of gathering information about the budgeting works and the um, technology that's in use and, and other things that will help them um, have the information they need as soon as they start. Great, thank you so much. So just to review our upcoming meetings, we have the DEI task force tomorrow at 3.30, policy as Elizabeth said, April 26th at 3 p.m. All of these are via Zoom. Uh, school board presents the budget to town council April 26th at six o'clock. Uh, the school board budget workshop will only be if needed um, the following night. Um, and then there's a finance subcommittee 
um, on April 27th at 8.30 a.m. May I have a motion? I move we adjourn. I knew that would be you, Laura. Laura Danino, thank you. May I have a second? Second. second. Oh, <laughs> we all second. A little clip, <laughs> always, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm guessing there's no discussion. So Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jen McFay. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you to everyone for being here, to administrators for sitting through this very long meeting. I appreciate it to everybody for their work and I hope everybody has a fantastic evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good night. Good night.